Uh, I will call this meeting of the Planning and Development Board for the City of Ithaca to order. Uh, we'll start with introductions. Emily, could I start with you? Emily. I have no idea. Where, 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 where do we sit? We're good. Keep We're good. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. So I've heard anyone. All right, we'll start over. Uh, it is now 6.03. I will call to order this meeting of the City of Ithaca Planning and Development Board. We'll begin with agenda review. Emily, not agenda review, introduction. Emily, could I start with you? Emily Petrina, member of the board. See you. CJ Randall, member of the board. Elizabeth Godden, member of the board. Vince Glass, member of the board. Eric Black, member of the board, and liaison to the Board of Public Works. Uh, Lisa Nicholas, director of planning and development, staff to the board. Rob Lewis, board chair. Nikki Sarah, environmental and landscape planner, staff to the board. And it looks like Daniel. Daniel Correa, late uh, member of the board. Thanks. Awesome. Sam. Sam. Sam Quinn Jacobs, assistant planner, staff to the board. I apologize for skipping you, Sam. You were at a different table, so it didn't happen. <laughs> um, now we'll do a gender review. Okay. Um, the changes for agenda review, we don't have any minutes to approve, so you'll have plenty next time. We'll get those out early so you can review them. Um, we have one added zoning appeal, which is VZA 3245, the ATT batch. And if you brought your computers, you can look at that. And I also, I also can show it here. Yeah. And as well, we will not be determining seeker for Breeze Apartments, which is Project B. Um, they're not going to go to the VZA until January. So there are some variants and questions, and um, we now have to. December, the determined seeker. All right. We'll skip the approval of minutes and go straight to public comment. Uh, is there any member of the public wishing to speak before the board? No, nobody registered, but I am seeing some people in the waiting room, but I'm not sure. Oh, um, well. let, let's let them in. Yeah, or, I'm not sure if they're part of the project team. Sure. Dustin Welch and Daniel Patrick, for those that are familiar to me, so. We'll let in one if you would. No. Good evening. This is Daniel Patrick. I'm actually here for the AT&T matter, just observing. Okay. okay. Um, and then the other fellow? I figured it out. Dustin, uh, can you hear me? Justin, are you here? Looks like you're muted. Sorry, I was here for I'm here for the market view project. Okay. Great. All right. Well, thank you much. We'll just keep you here because that's great. All right. So there's no members of the public wishing to speak before the board. We will keep moving to site plan review. Project A for that is Cuba Park. So Jacob, do you, who else is in your team today? Hi, uh, yes. Uh, so we already have Dustin Welch. Uh, if Trevor Hawk is um, on the waiting list, if you could let him in. And uh, we, okay. Um, and if Tim Crilly is there, um, I think we can get started uh, without them. But uh, just wanted to uh, see if they were available. Great. Uh, we'll let them in as they arrive. And if you would, please introduce yourself and take it away. Hi, yes, I'm Jacob Von Mecco. I'm with Whittem Planning and Design and uh, here representing uh, the Huga Park project, um, specifically for the uh, Building A or the Market View uh, building. Um, I don't know that I can share my screen in this uh, setup. Um, not sure if uh, I have the permission to do that. Can be, yeah. Maybe I could I could use some guidance on uh, how that happens. Do just share it. Uh, you have permission to share. 
unlike the uh, typical uh, Zoom meeting, I do not have a button showing share screen. Uh, Are you on your it. phone by any chance? No, no, I'm on a laptop. Uh, just, I think it's the, um, the setup tonight. Should be, it was just the same as last time. So it should still be there. If you hover your cursor yeah, down there. He should be, he hasn't been promoted to account. Hey, Jacob, are you trying to show the presentation that you sent around earlier? I can, I can show it on my end if that helps. You should have it now. <clears throat> can you hear me? Can. All right. Thank you. Uh, so if you can see my screen, uh, we are again looking at the Hugo Park uh, development project, and we are focusing tonight on uh, the market view building or building A. Um, I believe the board is fairly familiar with this project and this site in particular. We were here uh, in October um, and also attended the PRC meeting this month. Uh, so I, I won't go into too great of detail, but we are here to talk about the two uh, outstanding conditions uh, that were added uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, to the final site plan approval update. Um, those were relating to the uh, large blank facade at the entrance uh, on both sides of the building, as well as uh, a requirement to show the final landscaping uh, details and uh, components uh, specifically around those entrances. Um, so I'll just run through uh, some of the things we heard uh, last month and what we have changed in response to them. Uh, again, this is the building um, in its current condition as of uh, uh, a week or two ago. Uh, some advancement has been made since then, but uh, this gives you a general idea of what the building is looking like uh, currently. So the, the three main uh, concerns that we heard uh, from the board at last month's meeting were that the uh, the landscaping and furnishings added around the entrance on the southeast side of the building did not sufficiently mitigate uh, this large blank facade. Um, the other concerns were that uh, because we weren't showing any renderings of the entrance on the other side of the building, uh, the board did not feel that they were able to make a determination of whether or not that was being efficiently mitigated. Um, and then the third concern was relating to the sidewalk layouts uh, around the, the building. So. Uh, in answer to the first concern, uh, we have proposed some modifications to this entrance. Uh, specifically, um, one recommendation that was made by the board was the uh, incorporation of signage on the facade in question. Uh, so we are showing a, a concept for that. Uh, obviously, the building signage would need to get a building permit, and you will have an ample opportunity uh, when we submit that permit to, to comment on the, the style and size of the sign. Um, uh, another recommendation was for uh, string lights uh, or, or lighting to be uh, looked at in this area. We interpreted that as uh, string lights being a, a good solution to uh, create an overhead plane in this plaza. Um, another comment uh, was just relating to uh, additional elements that could be added up against this facade. So we're looking at uh, putting a planter along the base, um, something with some uh, hardy vines uh, with a twining uh, character so that they wouldn't go crazy, but uh, still draw the eye down to the, the lower section of this wall. Uh, and then we've also proposed changing the color of the furnishings uh, near this entrance to be uh, brighter and, and more uh, eye-catching. Uh, as opposed to the uh, more simple black uh, finish that we had previously proposed. The, uh, yeah, just another image uh, showing that, uh, again, this is just an update from what you had previously seen. So the second uh, concern uh, relating to the other entrance, what we're proposing here, um, first off, just, just showing you an image and rendering of this, um, in the foreground of this image, you'll see that there's a pretty substantial arborvitae hedge uh, that's part of the planting plan. Uh, initially, this was uh, conceived as a way to screen the railroad tracks, which are directly adjacent on this property line from the residents in the building. 
but uh, obviously this will also act as a buffer for any um, anyone outside of the, the property looking uh, directly at this wall and facade on the side of the building. It, it should be screened fairly well. <clears throat> um, some other things that we included here uh, was an additional plant bed um, in front of these two accessible parking spaces to get some planting and uh, canopy in this area. We also are showing uh, planters against this blank facade and the addition of uh, benches on the side as well. Just another image of that view. Um, relating to the third concern, uh, we have included um, a number of diagrams showing some of the constraints um, on the uh, sidewalk layout. Uh, one mitigating factor that we feel is, is sort of been overlooked in our, our previous uh, presentation. Um, there is a, an entrance on the uh, side of the building closest to the rest of the development, uh, which will be both an entrance and an exit. Uh, this is directly adjacent to the playground. Um, an entrance and an exit for tenants of the building, of course. Um, so it would have limited access. Obviously, it's not a public building, it's a residence. But um, this would be the most direct route for people uh, leaving the building uh, to visit the rest of the site. And we were asked at the PRC if we could provide a view uh, in the model space here of, of that entrance. So this is just a uh, an update to the site plan, still a little bit diagrammatic at the moment. Uh, we wanted to run this by you before we finalize these updates in the construction drawings. But um, this is the location in front of those ADA parking spaces uh, where we have uh, proposed removing this section of flush curbing and um, ADA ramp in, uh, in favor of a, an additional plant bed in this area. The two additional benches, the overhead lighting. This diagram uh, illustrates uh, sort of that third concern relating to the, um, the pedestrian access and routes around the site. Um, I've highlighted the entrances to the building in yellow here. You see this this building this building entrance here on the end close to the playground uh, provides a fairly direct route uh, across the street and down to the rest of the development. Um, and what we really wanted to highlight with this was that if what had been requested previously, an additional sidewalk on the building side of Buga Park Lane, if that were to be included, it it would not actually reduce the distance that tenants leaving the building would travel to head uh, to the uh, that direction and, and the rest of the site, uh, because most more than likely they would be exiting from this door as opposed to this door. Just an overall diagram showing the overall uh, site circulation. Um, really just trying to highlight here the extents of the pedestrian circulation on the site, um, which are fairly extensive, and it actually is a fairly well-connected section. There is, of course, this one piece uh, at the bend of Puke Park Lane, where the board had noted uh, that there was not a connection for sidewalk. Um, so we wanted to go through, you, uh, through with you the reasons why that is. So this right here is, is one of the major limiting factors for that road alignment. It's this existing NYSEG pole and the support guy wire anchor uh, that falls right where that sidewalk would be. And we, we do not have the ability to relocate this as part of this project. This diagram illustrates the other, uh, both that limiting guy wire location and the other limiting factor, which is the existing property line uh, for the, the B and W supply uh, parcel, um, we are unable to cross that line with our uh, sidewalks and road alignment. And so you can see how the alignment of Cuba Park Lane and the sidewalks are limited uh, by that and have to snake through this opening, um, which restricts our ability to provide a contiguous sidewalk on that side of Cuba Park Lane. Um, 
But we do want to point out, looking back at this uh, diagram, that the majority of the attractions, uh, in fact, all of the destinations would be on the other side of Cougar Park Lane anyway. So anyone traveling in this direction would at some point desire to cross Cuba Park Lane. Uh, there are very limited destinations on the other side. So crossing earlier rather than later, uh, we feel is not a significant loss in site circulation. Uh, one of the final limiting factors is the height difference between the finished floor elevation of the building and the uh, grade of the Cuba Park Lane um, as you can see, the curbs have already been installed. The asphalt is already down. That is built per the approved site plan for phase one, um, which is a, a little bit of a discrepancy in what we had uh, presented previously in October. Uh, I had erroneously stated that these parking spaces on Cuba Park Lane were serving the tenants of the, uh, the Market View building. Um, in fact, they are on the medical office building parcel and will be public parking spaces. They will not be reserved for tenants of the Market View building. They will serve uh, the public. And um, one can imagine on uh, farmer's market days, they will provide some limited relief to the farmer's market parking lot. Uh, that's about the extents of the presentation here. Uh, so I will take a break here and let you uh, ask some questions. Thank you very much. Um, so just to remind the board, what we're looking at to do today um, is to look at two conditions. One, a relatively expansive site details condition that includes landscaping, and the other, a facade condition focused on the, the two walls that he outlined next to those entrances. Uh, so we're trying to decide whether what we've seen satisfies what we need to see in response to those two conditions and whether is there anything else you feel like you need to see before we approve them? Eric, could I start with you? Yeah, I'm good to go. All right, Eric's good to go. Yeah, I'm also good. I think the additions are a nice uh, update to upgrade to the building. I think it brings it more in line with a market rate building kind of feel. Um, the nice amenities with the signage and the overhead lighting. I think really um, solves that entry issue. And I, I appreciate the, um, the circulation diagrams because that helps understand how people move through the building and then can exit it on the side towards the sidewalk um, as opposed to coming through the front. That makes a lot of sense to me. So I think there's a good change. Thanks. Elizabeth. I thank you for your presentation. Um, I agree. I think these are nice changes. However, the lights hanging out in the air like that seem odd to me. I would um, prefer to see an exterior shading structure like a pergola to support those. And I think that would be a really nice addition to the patio. Other than that, all the diagrams were helpful. And, uh, yeah, that's my only suggestion. CJ? Yeah, thanks for these updates. Um, still think people are going to be bolting through that patio landscaping to get to the other side of the Puget Park Lane, but whatever, it'll just be a desire line. But thanks very much. Um, for me, I think it looks great. I wasn't involved in the original process, but um, the, the only thing I might add is I think I'm, I'm not opposed to the string lights so long as they're you know sturdy and, and, and um, the kind that would withstand many I think, winters. Um, I also, I know we can have a bad rep for bringing up uh, signage a lot, but it's a little hard to read the market view in in, in, in that orientation, not opposed to it. It might be better if it was two words. Um, that might be me being nitpicky, but otherwise it looks great. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, I agree. These updates and the views are really helpful. Um, I think it's nice to so. Um... I feel comfortable moving forward with the resolution as is. All right. Um, so there is a consensus that the conditions have been satisfied. There was one comment that a structure to support the lights um, might be worth looking at. I would tend to agree. Uh, by and large, I think that this is a you know, compelling answer to the questions we had. Uh, and I know that Lisa had something. Yeah, I just had um, I just had one more comment about the sidewalk. So the sidewalk on the west side that just stops. 
So you did say that all of the attractions are on the east side. However, there's you know an acre of community gardens on that side. So if someone wanted was going to park and walk to the community gardens or people from, how would they? It just stops. Is it? Is there something we're not seeing? Like, is there um, that has been approved by the community on the community gardens? Like, how do you get into the community gardens once that sidewalk stops? Because the entrance seems to be right that. You know, if you were going to park right along the street and walk into the community gardens, how would you do that? So, if if you were parking on this side of the street, um, you you would need to um, more or less immediately cross to the sidewalk on the other side uh, to to make your way to the community gardens. Um, Where's the entrance to the community gardens? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing. Sorry, the the, the community gardens is is here. Where's the um, entrance? You would walk into right so there's there's several entrances and I'm, I'm not sure how often each one will be open um but there is there's one here which is more of a vehicular access um there is also i believe a secondary entrance at this location uh, so you are correct that um this half of the community gardens um is one of the destinations on this side um, and that the end of the parking, the end of the sidewalk on the west side, why would someone go all the way to the end of there? Is there a destination there that I've not seen? Or is there an entrance to the community gardens there? Or uh, at this location? The the north, the end of the north, the, it's, it's park, just parking. It's just for parking. It's to access the park. Okay. That's right. All right, all right so that's it. Thank you. Um, and then I think we said something else on the conditions yeah once you're finished so uh, we can look at that after we move the resolution is there anyone not ready to move forward with the resolution that these conditions have been satisfied seeing none is there a motion said resolution i see emily move and daniel second uh, before we move into a vote lisa has something to add uh Yes, um, so it sounds like you're fine with remo removing, saying these conditions have been satisfied. In looking over the conditions for the whole project, I found a condition that um, had, it was stated that it was satisfied, but I can't find any documentation of that. And I've asked, I've been going back and forth with the applicant about it. And it was a pretty important one. It was a letter of commitment about the improvements on um, thir uh, thir Route 13 and that they should be. Um, um, funded by the applicant, installed in a design, that was, and uh, that was removed from a, uh, the previous approval condition, and we have not been able to locate an executed letter of commitment. So I'd like to add that back in before a, the next building permit. So I would just take what was in the, the, the exact language from uh, from the previous resolution was the develop, development by the applicant and acceptance by the city of a plan and schedule for the financing and implementation of transportation and emergency access improvements detailed in the piece part three or other alternative improvements deemed equally appropriate and affected by the city. And then in the previous resolution, there was a description of what the letter of commitment should include. So, um, to do that properly, we would need someone to move that amendment to the resolution. Is there such a motion? I saw Elizabeth move and Emily second. Is there any desired discussion on the amendment before we vote on the amendment? Seeing none, uh, we'll roll call vote for the um, amendment. Um, Emily? Yes. Daniel? Yes. CJ? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Mitch? Yes. Eric, yes. I'm also a yes, so that is amended. Is there any uh, further discussion desired on the resolution itself as amended? Seeing none, we'll do another roll call vote. Um, Emily? Yes. Daniel? Yes. CJ? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Mitch? Yes. Eric? Yes. I'm also a yes. So two conditions have been satisfied in this resolution and another has been added and we will see this project again. Thank you very much to the applicant. All right, thank you. Next up, we have Breeze.
Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Um, so we won't be doing a seeker determination today, but we are hoping to go over the new materials and get any insight we can on the state of the overlook. Uh, yes. And with that, if you could introduce yourself and take it away. Okay, so I'm Laura Matos from VISM, and I have with me Eric from SWBR, Julia um, from the VISM team as well. Um, I also understand that uh, during the last meeting with the board, um, they um, you requested some more information, especially like more visuals of what the, the brownfield cleanup process looks like, what a typical day of the cleanup look like, and I'm happy to share that as well with you. Great. Thank you very much. And Nikki, we also have Marley um, from SWBR team, uh, the landscape architect. She's in. Thanks. Thank you. So if you don't mind, I can start sharing the, um, the presentation that I put together for the brownfield cleanup, and then we can start flowing for the other topics. Please stop me if uh, I'm sharing too much information, okay? Um, are you seeing my presentation? Yeah. Okay. So um, these are the involved parties in the cleanup. The CNS uh, companies, they are the environmental consultants. They will be on site every day, every time that there is any movement on site of any work that Gorick, the contractor will be doing, CNS will be there to monitor, document, make sure that the work is being done based on the DEC requirements. And every um, everything that was already approved by DEC so far was submitted by CNS. It's kind of like a third party that will be managing the process. Um, Seneca Meadows is where Gorick's team will be sending um, uh, the soil that will be disposed. They are based in Waterloo. And later in the presentation, I'll show you the, the, the path that they would take to get there. And this can be changed based on your feedback, but that, that's their proposal. Um, and everything is being done uh, by DEC and the Department of Health requirements. Um, one of the requests was for us to show what are the monitoring equipment, what they look like. So basically every day they will be using this, this three equipments, the weather monitoring station to monitor the wind um, and other important weather things related. We will have one fixed air monitoring station in the property and we will have four mobile air monitoring stations. T a typical project of this scale uses two um, mobile air monitoring stations, we are doing above and beyond what typically is done to make sure that the community is happy that the that we are tracking everything that needs to be tracked um, at higher standards. Um, there are also monitoring stations that the, the monitoring stations will also have alarms that will go on if anything it's um, alarming and above the, the, the appropriate levels and that will uh, communicate to CNS um, on a phone. So as I said, the weather station monitors wind, uh, pressure, humidity, precipitation. Uh, the fixed air monitoring station will be placed right here, kind of like in front of the, um, the parcel, closer to the neighbors. Um, and this monitoring station will be monitoring two points. One is kind of like the typical human breathing zone, four to five feet above grade, and the other one would be higher. In, so like whenever there is a wind, it captures something that it's a higher uh, level. Um, we also have the, as I mentioned, the other mobile monitoring stations, they move every day. So depending on how the wind is blowing, they will position this and also depending on where in the property they will be doing work. And inside this little box, and you can see here the scale of it, uh, they have different equipments, but I want to point out that some important ones, the VOC concentrations are monitored by this equipment in yellow, and there is also this one that monitors like dust, mist, and aerosols. Um, this is an excavation plan that was approved by DEC. Um, basically, 
I, 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 this is all available in our website. I, I think it's very technical, but just so you, you can understand, we would be kind of like excavating up to the bedrock, um, wherever it's already grew, uh, darker gray, it's almost like a bedrock already exposed. Um, CNS would be uh, already have a plan where that would be a, a path that it's pre prepared for the trucks to go on that basically will try to be as possible like, as much as possible on the bedrock so it it is not putting more more dust to the air um and a typical day of the of the crew will be they the cns team arrive, arrives on site they will set up the weather station and the community air monitoring stations to see where the the wind is blowing um and they will begin the monitoring to establish this daily background conditions before the work is done. Um, the contractor will inspect erosion and sediment controls and the other site conditions. They have this daily health and safety briefing where they review what it's planned for the day in terms of work to be done. They define any work or specific or site condition specific health and safety concerns. And that's when they start work. So there are a lot of requirements when, like, until the moment that they can really start doing actual work. That would be excavation, soil handling, truck loading, um, and they will be doing employing, uh, employing dust control and suppression measurements as necessary. Um, and then any vehicle that it's coming in and out of the site has a lot of uh, control also on what it's getting out so it's like not bringing any contaminated soil outside so they are washed uh, the 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 wheels are washed um and if in the path of like going in and out if anything any soil it's spilled or dropped they have to immediately clean that um and this is the path that they should be they are proposing to take going down not taking any um uh, I would say like of the more dense uh, roads where like more residential happens. So they would go to this path and then go down to Waterloo where the um, Seneca Meadows waste disposal is located. Um, the last time that this um, the Seneca Meadows accept trucks coming in, it's 3.30, which kind of like limits uh, the duration of work hours for them. So they ask if we could start working at 6 a.m. I told them that probably that would be a no for, for the board and for the city. And so we would like to ask for 7.30 to 3.30, so from 7 to 3.30 if possible. Um, and then CNS also will monitor everything. So like during the day, they will be monitoring, um, continue monitoring weather conditions. Uh, if the wind changes during the day, they will make sure that the monitors are repositioned. Um, and they have this daily logs that I believe weekly are submitted to DC uh, for their review. This, I know you guys ask for a map. Um, because they change every day. This is one example of one of the maps and how it looks like they track where the, the upwind and downwind stations are located um, and any movement that is happening on site. Um, and finally, um, like what happens if dust is generated during the mediation, the remediation activities? There are a few techniques that they use. Um, uh, these are just some of them that um, I would like to list. They always wet the equipment. They try to limit the vehicle speed on site. That's something that I I believe it's also on Seeker, what is uh, on FIF. Um, they limit the size of the excavations. They they do all this that it's right here. Um, yeah, I feel like I tried to go as fast as I could. I hope this was helpful. I'm happy to provide more information. I tried to condense all the like pages and pages that we submitted so far. That's helpful, thank you. Okay. So with that, I will let uh, Eric and Marley take over. Thank you, Laura. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. So, we wanted to give just a brief update on where we're at with things, and then Marley is going to jump into, well, I guess I, I may turn it over to Marley here first with the 
caveat that um, since we last saw you, there has not been very dramatic changes to the overall building and site. Most of the development has been on the island and just providing some additional details with for that. So I guess with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Marley to go first and um, Marley will walk through a little bit of the landscape architecture and site plan just as a quick recap and then talk about the island and the development there. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, good evening, Marley Beers. I'm with SWBR Landscape Architect on this project. Um, I'll quickly give an overview of the building site and then we can talk more in detail about the overlook um, for the landscape architecture on the site. Uh, the site is fairly narrow. So we do have foundation plantings and we're uh, catching stormwater management uh, in front of the building there uh, adjacent to the parking lot. And we also have um, some foundation plantings wrapping around the building in front of the patio and next to uh, the drive lane going into the proposed uh, parking garage underneath the building. Um, and then the rest of the site is really just uh, trying to stabilize some of the slopes um, meadow seed mixes are uh, used in most areas with some lawns, um, lawn seed grass out front uh, to establish more of that front, front yard lawn look where uh, the rest of the site may be more naturalized um, to stabilize the site. Um, and as we move, uh, let me get myself my bearings north on the page, um, this is where we come to the overlook. Um, so this is a good view to show uh, how we get over to that area. Uh, there is a proposed bridge um, that goes over a bit of a depression um, between the two uh, sites there that gets you out to the overlook. And the overlook right now, um, we have it proposed as more of a natural uh, sto compacted stone dust path with some benches to uh, get some of the nice views that you have from um, that space. And Eric, if I can have you and to maybe some of the next views to show. Um, this shows a little bit better. This is an aerial view with our line work uh, overlaid on top. Uh, this shows some of the views that we're trying to capture and why we placed the overlook where we did. Um, we analyzed some of the existing condition pictures and uh, aerial views of this site to position this in the best position we possibly could. Uh, to take advantage of both the, the views of the waterfall and uh, views down um, looking west, uh, down Fall, Fall Creek Gorge and um, looking in that direction. So both views, both um, of the benches are positioned to get uh, the best views that they can. Um, and I think there are a few more documents in our package that show uh, what that looks like um, this is without the aerial view underneath, just looking at the line work there. Um, this shows a little bit more detail on the grading that we are um, coming over from the bridge from the proposed building site out to the overlook. Uh, so you can see there the proposed bridge, which actually is um, taking advantage of some old foundation from a previous bridge that was on site. Uh, so we're taking advantage of that existing structure, and this is a view of the building and how that overlook uh, comes into play with the existing um, uh, site that's there. And today there isn't access really to this, well, there's not, um, I would say, formalized access to this point. So this would be a new um, overlook, formalized overlook for the city. Um, this would be open to the public. Uh, so um, that is right now, I think that there is access from down below. Um, so this would allow for a different vantage point up above to um, both the east and the west. And I don't know, Eric, Probably. if there are any more, any more views. Yeah, I, think just, show. yeah I, I guess just two items that I might add to your presentation there. Thanks. That was great. Um, as far as sort of the landscaping goes on the overlook itself, we're not proposing a lot of new plantings over there. Um, it is uh, kind of a rock space and Marley certainly chime in if I uh, yep. if you have anything else to add. Um, and so, and then the second part is we can probably see it in some of the more, uh, a little bit better in some of these black and white drawings, but 
excuse me, my cursor doesn't want to cooperate here. Um, from a safety and sort of, uh, I guess from a safety standpoint, the pedestrian bridge itself, we'll look at some images of what the actual construction of the bridge is, but the bridge itself will certainly have guardrails um, and, and any of the uh, sort of areas around the bridge where there's a steep drop off will have guardrails. But as we move on to the island itself, our proposal would be to just essentially make some trail markers, which would be like some larger boulders and, and elements that uh, frame the edges. Um, and then we would essentially where this and where this ends up being more of a steep area, we are proposing that we there's an existing fence that sort of comes down at the uh, edge here. We would propose sort of tying in that with a similar type of fence. <laughs> Um, and at some point transitioning back to more of a typical guardrail scenario in front. So sort of, if you could picture this sort of around the um, overlook itself, there would be sort of like a guardrail height item that would, you know, provide safety, but also preserve the views. And then, you know, on this side where there is relatively close to where you'll be walking, um, we're proposing a fence there to sort of tie into the existing fence, just because right here there's, you know, this line kind of represents the edge of the of the ravine there. So on this side, we're, you know, there's really you're not very close to the edge on this side. So we'd sort of propose that um, it's not exactly necessary to have any sort of guardrail or or fencing on that side, um, but certainly open to any suggestions there. Um, I think you covered the rest of it, Marley. So. Um, I'll just really quickly pan to the bridge so that we can see that, although it's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, oh, we did have these images too. I, I think we had shared these previously. These are just some views that we took that you'll see. So this will be the image crossing the bridge before you cross the bridge sort of back on our side of the site. Um, this would be looking back towards the waterfall. This was taken um, in summertime, so certainly a little bit more grown in. This view is sort of just straightforward looking at the other side. And then this is the view sort of down Fall Creek looking back towards the lake. Um, Marley talked about this. I think this is just a nice little graphic to showcase sort of what we're dealing with in terms of scale and, and the raceway. Um, while it's not really a super steep drop off that we're crossing, it is deep at the um, sort of midpoint there. Um, so it's not like the steep drop off that you have at the actual gorge, uh, but the raceway does have some significant height to it. So that's a useful graphic, I think. And then finally, just um, after working with uh, our contractor, the uh, most straightforward way that we see to do this bridge is to use one of the prefabricated sort of trail bridges that uh, we've seen before. Um, so this is would be our proposal for that. So it would be just sort of a, uh, a metal bridge with a wood deck that um, we build some concrete foundations for and then set in place. So these are just some images. I think everyone's probably familiar with these. I know that there's one over the inlet uh, when you turn on to Buffalo Street off of 89. I think that's where it is. So with that, uh, I guess maybe I'll, do you want me to keep going into the architecture or would you like to talk about the overlook or if there are any questions on that before we quickly recap architecture and the rest of the design? Are there uh, significant architecture updates? Not really. Um, I did just want to recap a little bit. Nikki had sent a note about the zoning, so I was just going to recap the variances for this group and sort of reiterate that the that the architecture and the elevations are generally the same as they were before. Um, and I say generally, and that's probably conservative. That they're, they're pretty, they are the same as they were before. Um, I know that we went on a little bit of a hold with the developer agreement, kick back and forth, but generally the architecture in the building. It's the same. Great, that's helpful. Um, so let's go around the room and get a reaction to what we've seen. Um, feel free to respond to anything, but the things that I think are most fruitful <laughs> to get perspectives on are level of comfort with what we've seen on air monitoring uh, and the cleanup more broadly. Uh, and then level of comfort with what we've seen on the overlook. Um, you know, we're not doing secret today. Um, but I think that has more to do with BZA schedule than anything else. So think about whether you could be comfortable moving forward with Seeker next month with what we've seen so far, if there's anything else we need to see there. Um, you know, and then the, the things that leap out at me uh, to really decide whether you're comfortable with today would be the air monitoring and the um, overload. Mm -hmm. We're not doing Seeker today. Um, and Garrett, could I start with you? Yeah, so 
I don't I don't have a better answer, but I, I, I don't like all the trucks going by the high school and the middle school. Uh, I, I have to think about how loud the trucks are, how close they are to the schools, but particularly at the in the morning when buses are unloading and parents dropping kids off and in the afternoon, I think there just needs to be some thought about there not being a, a mix of heavy trucks full of contaminated soil and, and kids getting in and out of school buses and stuff. So I think just some thought needs to be made on that. I, I don't, I, it does seem like the natural way to go, but we just should plan for that. Um, second thing is um, it's difficult to see just from the visuals, um, but on that overlook, is there going to be a need for kind of trimming of shrubbery or, or nearby trees to kind of keep the views open? And if so, would where would that be in the city property or on the, I mean, obviously one would use to be open. So would the trimming need to be in the city property or the site property? And then who to maintain that moving forward and pruning the point. Oh, that's all I have. Great, thank you. Uh, Mitch. Uh, can you come back to me? Yes. Thank you. Elizabeth. Thanks for the information. Sounds like what you described uh, about the air monitoring is what's required by the Department of Environmental um, Conservation. So it uh, looks good. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Garrick. I didn't think about that, but I wonder if there's another way for them to get into, other than going through a residential neighborhood, which would be worse. Um, yeah, and then about the overlook, I think it looks good. I think it's a good addition um, to that Fall Creek area. So, and um, yeah, those guardrails are definitely necessary. It'd be nice if you could replace the existing fence because it looks like it needs it. So that it looks a little bit more uniform with your fence. I don't think it's a lot of added cost to your project and it would mitigate that. Um, as far as overgrowth, Garrett, or was it you that mentioned that? I don't know if we're allowed to be trimming in these areas. Uh, yeah. Um, but thank you. Good presentation, Eric. and. Uh, uh, Laura. Thank you, Elizabeth. CJ. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, I share some concerns about the how the whole route that's been indicated for the project, um, namely because um, I happen to live in a state road and I know that when trucks need to slow down, they tend to be uh, overutilized jake brakes. Uh, not that that's the purview of the planning board, but um, I find that to be extremely ir irksome um, because you know, there's brakes and then there's jake brakes and they're very, very loud. Um, the only other comment I'd say is um, I see that they're requesting a number of variances and um, can't say that I love the EFIS. Um, I think the EFIS is going to look for us real fast. So if we can do something about the EFIS, that would be great. Thank you, CJ. Daniel. Um, so I actually, you know, Laura, thank you for the thorough explanation. I think it's a, it's a really well thought out plan. Gary a great point about the route. I think uh, it's a total bottleneck. Um, and I think if we can get creative about that, there would be more comfort. From the start, I think you have a very thorough monitoring process. And you also have a really great public outreach platform for this project. To the extent that those can be combined to publicize the performance or um, the, the monitoring data on a daily basis, I think it would be a great service to you, right? Because you'd provide peace of mind and reporting to the public on um, uh, uh, the construction site. Um, and it seems that you would have the data. So I think that would be incredibly welcome. I think all the right components are there. You have a great dedicated landing page for this project um, and you're already collecting the data. So I think it'd be amazing to see that. And I think it would, it would alleviate a lot of the concern. Um, for the overlook, I think it looks great. No major comment. I agree with most of the comments that my, my colleagues have. Um, a little bit of a lighting junkie, and I think that non-intrusive, sort of non-exposed bulbs would be really good here, sort of down lighting. Um, there is railing with integrated lighting that would be precedent for this. Um, in uh, It's the, the Cornell Bridge that connects um, North Campus to Main Campus. I, I forget the road it's on, but it's the green railing and the lighting is inside the railing. You don't actually see the bulb. You just lights down so it doesn't obstruct or upstage the view. Um, it just provides wayfinding in a, in a very like subtle way. Just just an idea. I know you're still developing things out, but um, 
Just a thought. Emily. Yeah, thank you all for this presentation. I think it helps understand a lot of things that were left open ended. Um, Laura, I think that what you explained about the air monitoring was excellent. It really helped me. I feel very comfortable with the information that was provided and the parties involved. Um, and then I, I have a few questions about the bridge and the overlook. Um, you don't have to answer now, but I saw in one of the existing plans, there's some structure on the south side of the gorge under the bridge. And I wasn't sure if that gets removed as part of the project or if it remains a relic. Um, also, I have a five-year-old, so my danger meter might be artificially high, but <laughs> I'm not comfortable with just boulders. Yeah. Um, so maybe maybe there's a guardrail. I don't think it has to be a full fence, but just from my personal view, if there was some railing that would stop little people from walking through boulders, I would visit there more often. Um, I like the style of the bridge. I think it's a nice nod to the industrial past of the, of the site. And um, I wonder about hours. Does this get closed? It does because it's open all the time. Thank you. Great presentation. Great. Um, Mitch, you ready for me to come back to you? Yeah. <clears throat> I agree with um, what Emily was saying about the safety factor. And um, I don't know, the overlook just seems a little underwhelming to me. Um, and I was wondering if you know you would want to put a fence around the the island itself, because people are going to want to wander mm -hmm. off of that. They're not going to stay where the benches are. They're going to want to go to the edge. Mm -hmm. And the edge in the photographs that you showed looks very eroding. Like it looks like it's sloughing off mm -hmm. even in those pictures. So I don't know if you want to fence that whole area, but the fence has to be very non-intrusive. And I don't know if you want to go down that road, right? Because it's, I don't know, it's a design issue that doesn't need to be solved tonight but I, but again I think I think there's more of an opportunity here but I'd be very careful about getting it right and I just I don't think what you have there is quite right at the moment so I want to try to encapsulate what I feel like I've heard um and I want to ask a question about where we feel like we are and then I want to ask uh staff for their stuff um because they're gonna know and want to hear more stuff um but I heard some concern over route but a general level of comfort with the mitigation plan environmentally beyond route. I heard somewhat I would consider fairly substantive questions about how the overlook is going to work from a managing visitors and upkeep perspective. Um, and I think with both of those sort of sitting outside, if we had to do a secret vote tonight, like I'm not sure we clear the bar, right? Like it sounds to me like we're not quite there. Um, and so I think that's worth saying because they obviously would like us to, you know, be able to move forward with that when they're ready, you know, maybe as soon as next month. Um, and so I would also check in with staff about what they see as outstanding. Well, one thing, sorry, yeah. one thing, um, <laughs> I see is outstanding now that this has come together as an actual proposal for the overlook, um, Reminder that it is on city property, so I, we need to have the internal conversations about. You know, the concept was there, but now it's a plan. So there are things in the development agreement about fencing, and I don't remember exactly where the fencing has to be, but there is required fencing. And then the questions of will there be, you know, will there be vegetation maintenance to preserve view, or do we just get it? Like, should it be in that exact location or should it be in the how do we, what is the city's tolerance for liability and all those questions and the actual design? That all is an internal conversation that um, we should have very soon. And in fact, um, I just searched an appointment to do it uh, so and, and circle back with the other. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really a next step for that. So I think my question after hearing that is with that level of negotiation ongoing around the overlook. Are we able to execute on seeker, you know, with all that still outstanding? Tonight? No, no, not no. tonight, but you know. Well, let's see how the conversation goes. I think, you know, if we can reach a certain level of agreement and then details have to be, you know, I think, well, I'm sorry, I didn't change. You, yeah. Um, I think, and you know, then there's the issue of actually looking at any environment impact of it. I think we can figure that out by now. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think in, in in asking Eric, thanks. I mean, thanks everyone for this. Yeah, that was wonderful. Yeah, really helpful. Laura, the yeah. day in the life was great. Um, the question about the railing and the fence and the safety, I think that's mm -hmm. a huge, a that's huge it. one. And I think a perspective would work really well with that, like showing that. Um, but I think it also depends on what the development agreement has yes. in it for that. Yeah. Um, on the variance, I just want to bring that up quickly, Eric. Uh, it's not the off street loading is still not that's still up in the air. I, um, I don't think Megan has all the new materials. And I know you guys think there's three spots, but I don't know if they qualify underneath zoning. So that's why that's still there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I'll just spend 90 seconds recapping this, I guess. We uh, we submitted this back in August, and then everything got put on hold while we were doing the development agreement. So apologies on my end. I thought when Megan had asked us to resubmit this, it was just a formality because we were changing the planning board dates. Nothing has changed as far as I know. So the submission back from August, we're just going to change the dates. Um, the the, um, the loading that we have on here, if it, if there is an issue with it, just certainly let us know this is what we've had you know that we've had four loading spots that meet the criteria of the zoning as far as we're concerned um the, the variances that we do have are for rear yard setback and for total building height in feet and number of stories but both of those have been discussed with megan at length and i think she's fairly comfortable with those two so if the hold up is on loading i'm happy to have a conversation with her and i can do that yeah, yeah, it was. I just wasn't certain whether it can be in a turnaround of fire access. So, and I don't think those have changed a few times. So I'm not sure she has the most up to date. That's all. And then she can make it. Yeah, enough. sure. Yeah, there there has been minor updates with the with the bridge design. You're you're absolutely right about that. And um, we did have a conversation way back when with uh, Chief Parsons about the loading, and uh, that first loading zone is in the turnaround technically. And I think he was comfortable with it given the fact that there's three other loading zones and the likelihood of there being all four loading zones in use and a fire emergency where a fire truck needed to turn around was so low that he was, if I recall correctly, and we can verify this, he was comfortable with the one loading zone being in the turnaround technically. But if that doesn't mean zoning, that's a different story, so. Yeah. Right. And then I think that's, right. Go ahead. I was gonna say the only other thing that we had that's, um, was the lighting and i think you did um submit plans but i'm not yeah really sorry about that i forgot to i forgot to mention that we did submit some photometric plans um so on the exterior of the building there are just a few my let me see if i can if i can ever get there sorry about that um there are just a few minor um lights on the exterior of the building so mainly we we have lights at the uh, areas where you would expect lights like doors and, and the patios and things. So those are really not contributing a lot because they're just sort of the the lights that you would expect to see at like a door entry. But we did do the photometric plan for all of the parking lot lights. And I am not a lighting engineer, but the uh, the light drops off. This is the last light. Um, this is probably a better plan. This line right here sort of represents the, the ridge slash property line more or less and you, as you can see there's there's light around this door but it drops off substantially quickly once you get towards the edge of the property line so we're not showing any uh light diffusion off the property line and then this just for so that the planning board has it this is the proposed light inside that we're proposing for the parking lot lighting so you know they're fairly sophisticated these days and uh you know we tried to keep the light from spreading off property so if there's any other information on this, let us know. But um, hopefully this is, I think the question was, you know, could we have a photometric plan and see how it's going to work? So hopefully this is satisfying that requirement. I think Elizabeth had something on this. Um, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you meant lighting around the uh, overlook and bridge. I did, but I'm yeah. I guess what we're going to say. <laughs> she did, though. Yeah, some... sorry. There's two, we had two talk questions, about it. I think. He's talking about one that was in the the that we talked about last time. So that that was really in response to the question that we had last time about general site lighting. Um, the one about the overlook, I think, is a rel is a new one for me personally. I think that's a, a new one for us, um, and it, I think that's something that we'll you know take back to the design team and explore and see if there are options for that, and then um, understand that and talk with the board about lighting over there. And um, oh, got it. Eric, I, I just wanted to add to that. I think that's also 
a city question as well. Um, if they want, okay. would like this area to be accessible after dark. I think um, if you're asking pedestrians and the public to come to this area after dark, um, in our minds, I think that this would be something that would be closed after dark. So we wouldn't propose lighting on the bridge, uh, not, you know, in a way not to um, ask people to go out there at night. It would really be just something during the daytime. All right. Um, because we're over time on this, I just want to check in. Is there anything left from board or staff? Lisa? Yeah, I just had, I had one question because um, the, in relation to the route of the truck, so what does the board mean to determine what route? Because there's, I feel like there's multiple factors at work here, and I'm not sure. Part of it is like when is the deviation going to be done? If it's going to be done in the summer when school is in session, for instance, that does that change? Does it what? Um, does it matter what 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 DC thinks would be the best route or what? Transportation engineer thinks would be the best route. Like, what information do you need if this is going to be like to to think about this? I think Garrett goes. Well, yeah, I, I think the information we need is for them to consult with the school district. So the superintendent's office is right there, right along the path. And we call the superintendent and say, "Is this plan okay?" Or do are there certain hours of the day or days of the week or whatever? Okay, so from a like yeah. traffic management point, yeah, not from a contaminant. Because I heard different concerns. I heard traffic and I also heard contamination. Yeah, I, I think just consult the school district. Um, and then, Robin, I just want to add, I know this is, we're talking about a seeker and not design review, but I just want to, when yeah. we're summarizing comments, I just want to say I concur with CJ. And the, oh, I missed that. Yeah, the EFIS yeah. comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, which which I think is held by a good portion of the board. I'm not, I'm seeing some nods. I realize that it's hard to read the room when you're not in the room, but I think the room has a consensus of lack of excitement about EFIS. Uh, I would say specifically EFIS. Yeah, I guess. Um, if, if the board would be open to it, we I would uh, like to present some projects that we've done that have been EFIS and they've existed for a decade or so. Um, the EFIS is yeah, that I, I was installed 10 years ago, uh, it's not the same that we installed in the 90s. So I think it has come a long way, and I used to be someone I appreciate who would avoid that. that. I appreciate that applicant. Um, I think there's limited appetite for spending a lot of time on EFIS case studies because we've seen a bunch of them. You know, it's not that we are not aware that EFIS can look good in certain contexts. Um, it's just that we have run into projects that have used EFIS that we've approved that we have been un unhappy with. Um, and you know we would like not to make the same mistakes over and over forever. Um, so, so there is a lack of enthusiasm for that material that is consistently held by this board as a whole. Um, you know, specifically white EFIS on a difficult site. That you know, you got a lot of stuff to work. With, and I understand that. Um, now that said, what else do we have to get through on this project tonight, Mitch? Sorry, let me take extend this. There was a question about hours of construction operation. Yeah. Uh, what are, what's difficult for the city? Um, the ordinance is 7.30 to 5.30 p.m. Monday through Saturday, I think. But often, if it's in a residential area, the board does limit hours of construction. And I'll say if our concern about the route is really driven by cars backing up along that, you know, that stretch, you could limit it to not be when cars are there for pick up and drop off. The problem is you're going to end up with a time that's like, you know, 10 to 2, which is not really practicable. I thought it was more of a contamination issue that you were speaking about. I'm actually speaking really of contamination, noise, and traffic. All 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 I, I just think, I think all of those things should be looked at. Yeah. So I can, um, I can address that a bit. Um, the, I can get a confirmation from CNS if all materials that will be removed from the site are so like we can remove non-contaminated soil. And then he also said that there are a lot of times where we will have contaminated soil, we'll test, and then we will put some, um, treat that soil to be to become non-contaminated and then they will be moved to Seneca Meadows. So I can also, he, and, he mentioned that sometimes there are some soils that cannot be treated and these will be moved to a different landfill special out of state. I can confirm like 
How many times that happened? Is that something that we are expecting to exist? Because my understanding is that everything that will go to Seneca Meadows on Waterloo, it's actually non harzators anymore. So it's not contaminated. That's helpful information. Um, you know, that some backup on that, some context could be further further mm -hmm. help. Anything else you want to talk about tonight? All right. I'd like to thank uh, the applicant for helping us work through a lot of that. And I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Your presentation. It works. Uh, next up is Pulo Two London. Should we keep the We're just waiting for Steve to join. We're not thinking about doing like a like, like nighttime light show at nine o'clock. Because then we can have it, the lights shine, good colors, and then the laser beams. It has in the past been. Um, been um, suggested or recommended, or there were proposals to light up the falls. And I can't remember when, I think it's during the winter that night. Like the ice. Yeah. Yeah. To the, I it's sold. It has been. Yeah. 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 Like so. it was a, yes. Yeah. I think it's the winter, not the summer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Is the gang all here? Yes. All right. Introduce yourself. Take it away, please. Okay, so it's me again, Laura Matos from VISM, and I have Julia with me uh, from our team, and Steve Lugo from uh, Holt Architects. Oh, and we also have Adam from Marathon Engineering. Okay. And, uh, okay, so I can't tell, is, is everyone seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, so we're seeing the gem. Yes. Correct? Okay. Sure. Um, all right. Well, we're we're um, hopeful, optimistic. I think we were uh, potentially slated for preliminary and maybe final approval on this. We've um, been with you guys for a number of months on this relatively small project. Um, Adam is going to talk to us a little bit about the the site plan, and then I'm going to respond to some questions and comments that came up in PRC about the exterior, and then we would be more than happy to um, talk about anything that you all would like to discuss before voting. Um, let me just see here, Adam, I'm gonna, oops. Thanks, Steve. Um, Adam Fischel, Marathon Engineering, Civil Engineer for the project. Um, I think the site plan discussion can probably be a little on the brief side. I don't think there's been any really substantive comments that have come out of the last few meetings. Uh, so the site layout and plan itself has remained pretty consistent for the last few meetings. Um, we have put together what we feel is a, a fairly robust planting plan along Bull Street and uh, Linden Avenue that would combine both uh, street trees uh, and low level plantings uh, behind the sidewalk, uh, between the sidewalk and the building. Uh, we've incorporated a, a small seating area at the rear west side of the building, if you will, so screen left, uh, as requested by the planning board in an earlier meeting. Uh, that's basically going to be a stone dust uh, pad where a table and chairs uh, can be placed out there for, for folks to congregate and, and hang out. Um, the ADA ramp uh, switch inside to the building, uh, so the southeast corner there, the ADA ramp is going to be a stamped concrete uh, coming off the sidewalk on Boole Street uh, to the lower the lower basement level uh, with the sidewalk stairs coming down uh, from the main entrance to meet the sidewalk on Linden Avenue. Um, stormwater runoff will be collected from the roof, uh, roof drainage system and piped directly to the city storm sewer system. Um, we are in the process of coordinating with city engineering to address their remaining uh, minor comments that I, you know, the comments I believe are minor. Um, working on addressing those and providing them the uh, the basic script that they've asked for. Um, with that, you know, I think that that's the extent of the discussion on the site side. Okay. Um, I'm going to respond. So we 
in the past, we've had our design review meeting, and I think we generally had very positive feedback. In the last meeting, we had reported to all of you, one of the discussion points we had at one point was about um, projected bay windows that we that we had proposed on, um, uh, on the corner. And if you remember in the last meeting, we had to report to you that because we are at exactly 50% lot coverage as the building has been designed over many, many months in the past year, that we, we found out uh, working with Megan and, and the, the city that if, the, if those bays are to project, including, you know, basically we had like a two-story projection. And if that second story is projecting, it's not considered a projection, but it's considered part of the building. So we came back and had had reported that instead of that um, that projection being somewhere in the neighborhood of six to nine inches, we were going to only be able to project it about about an inch, and and still creating a shadow line, and still sort of creating a material change there. Um, and in PRC, I I'll share that um, you know one of the board members sort of you know, was saying it's a shame that the, you know, that the variance process would cause such a delay to try to, to try to do that. And the question was asked, um, you know, about the three dimensionality of the building. And if I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think we were sort of asked to summarize um, the, you know, sort of the status of the design with regard to its three dimensionality. Um, does that sound accurate, Lisa? So I was about to do that. Does that, yeah, I'm seeing a dot on this end. Okay, so so I wanted to just sort of recap the design. Um, you know, maybe going back um, a little a little bit in time. If you recall, some of the first designs we actually didn't. I'm sorry, was there a question? No. Okay. Um, in one of the uh, in the earlier design, we actually had um, a sunken entrance. Um, and we we had been requested to consider raising that entrance. We you know we thought that was actually a, a great idea. Um, we you know did add some cost to the relative construction of the of the project, but we understood that comment. Um, and um, when I when I think about this design overall, a couple of things I'd like to point out is that you know the scale of this of this building is. You know, not unlike that of a large single-family home in College Town, it's it it's about you know two and a half stories into the grade. Um, in in fact, the building that that is was previously on the site was you know essentially a, a former residence. Um, and for that reason, while we think about three dimensionality, I think one of the takeaways is the breaking up of that mass on Linden Street is pretty significant. Like the entrance. The entrance to the building is a recessed entrance that's you know approximately five or six feet deep in so that building has sort of this carved out shape into it um uh adding to that we are proposing a wood uh sunshade structure or trellis that covers that so it kind of cuts in and then that canopy is um is pushing out um this I am, I do need to point out, this is a rendering that was created a few months ago. So when I get to the 2D elevations, it actually is a better representation of all the window openings. Um, but this diagram is just trying to show the elements that you know we think create the visual interest in this facade. The materiality, that being a, a, a horizontal dark siding in combination with a vertical faux wood siding. And those two planes, in general, when you look at this facade, there's about an inch or to an inch and a half of play. So every time you see the dark siding and the wood siding, um, there there is a shadow line that's created both vertically and horizontally um, in in the in the facade. Um, the window openings are then sort of recessed about another another inch back from the siding. So the windows are then pushed back as well. And you know, again, I think the addition of that stair creates a lot of three dimensional dimensionality in the facade as well. The stair sort of reaches out to the sidewalk, and then the entrance is sort of set back. Um, I, 
all most rest of these drawings that I'm showing you are all drawings that you've seen before. So we are um, looking at a um, manufactured stone at, that marks the the ADA ramp that's that's going down to, to the lower entrance. Um, there is a, a visual sample of the the dark siding, which is a lap siding about a six to eight inch profile, and then the the wood colored siding. You can see um, item A, and this was previously a hand sketch that's showing sort of the overlap of those sidings, the the shadow line that's created between them. So these are the latest elevations that you also had um, last month. Um, the, the previously in the very, very early design, we had glass going all the way down to the floor. And we had explained, you know, later that it, within those apartments that was really causing uh, conflict. So that has become the, the wood accent. And um, so I'm just pointing that out because the rendering was showing the glazing being slightly different. Um, we do have this sort of branded moment of the, the gem hanging off the facade in the 202. I'll, I'll point out, this is where that wood structure would be that's floating between the, the five foot recess in the facade. Um, and again, everywhere that we go from the dark siding to the wood siding, we have about you know an inch to inch and a half of, of reveal and shadow line. Um, this is just a side elevation showing the, the stair. It's a metal stringer with concrete steps and uh, um, and a steel uh, handrail. And inside, this is actually, this lower elevation is an elevation as if you were walking down the ramp and looking back towards Linden. And so this um, material, hatch material here is showing that stone wall. That's the stone um, up against and retaining the earth. And these are actually similar to the hand sketch details you before you saw before. This is just a a wall section that's showing um, how the the siding materials and the siding reveals are created. And with that, Laura, uh, Julia, do you have anything else, or we, should we just turn it back over to the board for questions? I think we can turn it back. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all. Um, so I do want to remind the board that we are looking at a potential preliminary and final approval tonight. So make sure that your comfort rises to that level. Um, and I'll just go around the room. Garrett, can I start with you? Yeah, I'm comfortable as long as we're not eventually going to see a sign with the diamond <laughs> logo on it. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, we go. Uh, my understanding is that we would uh, have a bite of the apple for any sign of approvals where we don't <laughs> have a glowing diamond mesh. <laughs> yeah. All right, Elizabeth. Good presentation. I enjoy the drawings and the detailing. Um, yeah, I'm good to go. CJ. Same, thank you. Daniel. I'm also good to go, but again, about the diamond. It's a beautiful building. It's a very ugly diamond. Um, <laughs> sorry. Maybe perhaps a bit more abstracted. I get the concept. I, I don't disagree, right? But it's an elegant, beautiful building. It looks like it could be in Northern California, right? I think a sign that, 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 that speaks to that would be to your benefit, right? <laughs> Emily. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for the presentation. I think I missed a month, but um, uh, <laughs> you know, the the detailing with the reveals I think works on a building of this scale or smaller. I think as it gets larger, that those reveals are less seen, but I think you can get less deep. So um, otherwise, good to go. And I, I agree with the diamond. <laughs> All right. So I'm hearing, uh, you know, a consensus on both building and sign. Did you get the guidance you need. Uh, I want to check with staff. Is there anything we should discuss before I look for a motion for preliminary and final? I just had a quick question because we did have someone call about the trees and taking them out. Um, I'm just wondering if you're removing all of them. That's why, because on a lot of your plans, it said you were trying to save them, but um, that's not what we heard from the person removing them. Correct. Um, there, I think there was a a comment or a note on our previous version of our drawing that had some plantings or some smaller trees at the let's see the southwest corner that we were yeah. trying to preserve but we are we're going to be taking those out and putting in some plantings and a, a street tree there to i believe the street tree is the same species as the other three that we have along google okay 
Anything else before we look for a motion on the resolution? Seeing none, is there a motion for preliminary and final approval? I saw Elizabeth move and Emily second. Uh, any further discussion of said resolution? CJ? We'd have to do the transcription demand. <laughs> Supposedly well, we're okay. doing that second. Um, that yes, I'm, one, I'm wondering if we need to add a condition. This is something hopefully that Lisa can answer and then weigh in, please. Um, I noticed on the engineering comments that they said they need a staging plan and work zone traffic control plan to review prior to construction um, because they, they're saying you cannot close Bull and Linden. So I'm wondering if we should add that as a condition, you know, to um, within six months of site plan approval or start a construction before building permit. Before, before building, building permit. permit. Okay. Okay. Staging. No problem. <laughs> you can plan. All right. So to the satisfaction of the city. Yes. All right. So under issuance of the building permit, there's a proposed amendment that they need to uh, give us a staging plan that satisfies the city engineer. Is that, is that what we're saying? Yes, okay. staging plan and um, traffic. Traffic. Staging. Traffic and traffic. Yeah. 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 Uh, stage. Construction logistics. Yes. Construction logistics. All right. Yep. So, I also haven't gotten sign on from uh, the fire department. So we should have a condition that before um, issuance of the building permit, they have to get life safety needs. Okay, so we're going to have two conditions under before issuance of the building permit. First, the construction logistics plan. The second is satisfaction of life safety concerns. Um, any opposition to those conditions? All right, I believe we do have to do a roll call vote for that amendment, though. So I'm going to go around the room. Actually, no. Is there any move? Does anyone care to move that amendment? Elizabeth moved. Daniel seconded. Uh, we'll go straight into a vote. Garrett, for the amendment. Yes. Mitch. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. CJ. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Emily. Yes. I'm also a yes. The resolution is amended. Any further discussion before we vote on the resolution as a whole? Seeing none, I'm now taking a vote on the resolution as amended. Garrett. Yes. Mitch. Yes. Elizabeth. Yes. CJ. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Emily. Yes. Yeah. I'm also a yes. You have final approval. That brings us to the TDMP. So you do have a yellow resolution about the TDMP and a very brief TDMP in your packet. Um, the resolution near as I understand it, we just approved the TDMP they submitted, um, which I'll say is fairly straightforward. Uh, I'll give you a second to read the document and if and when someone is ready to make that motion, I would entertain it. I saw CJ move and Elizabeth second. Now opening the floor for discussion on the TDMP and or the TDMP resolution. People feel comfortable moving towards the vote. Anybody not feel comfortable moving towards the vote? Seeing none, I'm going to go into a roll call vote. Garrick? Yes. Mitch? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. CJ? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Emily? Yes. I am also a yes. So we have approval of the TDMP. Uh, and I believe that's it for this project tonight. Thank you for the applicant. It's a beautiful building. Uh, and I can't wait to see it. Without the diamond, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and that brings us to the citizen. I'm still sharing, correct? Yes. Yeah. Are we waiting on anyone? Do you have we need? I think we have everyone. Great. Uh, take it away, please. Okay. Um, so I guess a, a couple topics this evening. Um, we know that you're, I think that you all want to review at least a section of the FIF, and we have probably not responded to everything, but uh, that's pro I'm sure you guys are going to talk about that, and we're here to answer questions. Um, we are here to talk a little bit about the exterior development. We've had some 
generally good um, comments and and uh, responses to the direction. Although in the last meeting there were some questions about you know could there be a could we create again more three dimensionality um, in the in the facade and also could we create some renderings that might better explain both what's happening on the ground plane and what's happening on the exterior. And so we'd like to share with you some renderings that we've been working on. Um, I was thinking to myself, I haven't been in council chambers in a while, but I remember whenever I presented renderings, I like turning out those lights that are right next to the presentations, right next to the, the, uh, the screen. I don't know if you guys can do that. Um, yeah. that that's how we live now. Okay. Um, so uh, th this is a rendering. Again, we were, we're trying to capture some of the things that are happening on the ground plane, as well as looking at investigating um, some of the exterior development. I'm going to um, leave the presentation mode so I can maybe zoom in around uh, this diagram a little better and show you what's happening in our current design. Um, I will start with maybe a little bit here at the ground plane. There were some questions previously about, um, and I think rightly so, the pinch point of the building and the corner of Meadow and Buffalo. And you'll, I'll show you in a moment in floor plan that previously we had carved into the ground floor, um, basically back to this corner column, but we had almost you know, full fit out of the ground floor on Meadow Street. Um, and you know, I'm actually gonna jump ahead for a moment and then come back. Um, our previous building design, is everyone sort of oriented here? This is Buffalo and this is Meadow. And th this is that you know little piece that sort of protrudes on the corner. We had previously, I'm gonna go ahead and take my markup tool. Um, we previously had our storefront do something like this. And this was our, this was our retail space on the corner. Um, I think we're, Happy to report to you that after looking at that and after your comments, we thought maybe we could ease that edge and open up that corner. Um, the dimension from the bollards to that curb or someplace around six or seven feet. And we thought if we could open up that corner, we could provide something more like 23, 24 feet um, at that corner. Um, come back to the rendering. So if I zoom in on that corner, you'll see we're envisioning a uh, ground face, uh, eight, eight by eight dark masonry, a material that would be um, you know, durable for the, for the ground level at, at, as the columns. And then at the back of the opening, storefront and potentially these accent panels, which are, would be the same accent color that we would we might recommend on the upper section. We previously talked to you about the, the wall panel being um, two different uh, fiber cement panels, may, potentially something like a Nichiha panel that scored and two, two different textures of with two different exposures, uh, sort of the larger exposure at the bottom and the higher exposure at the top. Um, a dark accent panel that would read uh, the same color as the window frames. We wanted to create that verticality in those in those openings in the overall facade. Um, and then a lighter colored uh, gray panel that marks the horizontals at the floor. Um, also a fairly new development. We had previously shown a glass slot on the Buffalo Street facade, but I think in response to your comments about could we create, you know, could we cut into this facade a little more? We have proposed making that opening deeper, maybe as much as a foot, and then um, potentially creating that sort of as we cut into the building, we see that accent color in the cut section of the building. It's a little hard to tell in this rendering, but this accent that goes the entire four stories of the building is actually um, recessed into the building. And these other verticals that you're seeing are more like a sunshade. They're projecting 12 to 18 inches off of the facade. Did I, did I hear a question? No. 
Okay, I'll, I'll keep rolling. Um, um, also, you know, a new development, we're creating this, this slightly triangular kind of marquee that marks the front door where potentially there's this branded moment of the citizen. And below that space, storefront that would probably be our community space. Um, we are proposing, and I'll show you in a later slide, a, um, a local artist mural. Um, and maybe if Laura can elaborate on that if she's if she's ready to, but she I know she's been talking with some local um, artists and we've been thinking about a mosaic um, uh, mosaic panel there. And that's right at the front the front entrance to the building. That's where uh, residents, one of the entrances that residents would be able to enter off the street. Uh, we have a similar this um, this similar sort of four story slice through the building on Buffalo, that is a completely new development. Prior to this, that was, you know, that facade was mostly interrupted except for the window openings. Um, and I'll just remind you all uh, that the back, the back section of the building, later I'll show you a floor plan. This is, a, this is a very long building. This is just the headpiece of the building that happens at the corner. We, the back part of the building is actually more of a beige material than a gray. So we're not, we're not um, suggesting that the gray panel is the entire length of the of the building. Um, this is a slightly different angle at the ground floor. The renderers actually accidentally didn't show storefront here. There really should be uh, storefront glazing here. But this angle allows you to see down Meadow Street. Um, if you recall, previous to us sort of cutting into the Buffalo Street facade, We've always shown the building set back from the property line, which is about in this location, I think about six or seven feet. So we have the full sidewalk condition that's there today. Plus we've cut that, um, that section of the building back an additional six feet to create places maybe for small tables and, and small seating areas um, along the storefront. And there is um, a landscaping strip along there as well. Um, I already showed you this plan, so I was just trying to highlight how we've opened up the corner. Um, Adam, do you want to just speak briefly to the section at the street? Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, I think Mitch had to comment at the PRC meeting asking for just a quick kind of street level view cross section of the Meadow Street condition uh, that would result. So essentially out there between the curb and the sidewalk, there's about a five foot tree lawn, not even tree lawn, it's like a brick a brick paver area between the curb and the sidewalk. The sidewalk itself is about seven and a half feet wide uh, until you get to the property line. And then we have, as Steve mentioned, roughly um, just shy of seven feet available between the property line and the face of the building that fronts on Meadow Street that's available for say patio seating or, um, you know, a, a planting strip of some sort. Uh, we're trying to limit the height of the overall plantings in that area so it doesn't screen the storefront. Uh, but we also need to be aware of, um, you know, picking some plants that are salt tolerant because of the heavy traffic and the salt spray from Meadow Street. So that's, you know, kind of the condition that we're trying to create there. Yeah, I can talk about this. Um, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the whole overall idea for this project was always to pay this homage to the Ithaca citizens. And uh, I always love the murals from Anne-Marie Zwag and uh, that are on the Science Center and some other places. Um, I spoke with her. We are studying the how it, the, the panels work structurally to make sure that we have um, a solid um, structure for it behind and also discussing cost. But one of the things that attract me to potentially um, have a mural like that here is the process of creating this mural. You can have um, people from the community participating in, in putting that together. And I think that's nothing more special than like going by a project, passing by a, a building and saying like, wow, I made that I was part of that process. I think that's really magical. So um, that's the, the the idea. If financially or structurally, uh, we cannot make the mosaic work, 
Uh, we can also uh, talk with Vita Camuros for the, the painted one, but I think for this project, I would love if we can make it work with the mosaics. And I think another thing is like, um, I'm sorry, um, is um, we put that as a focal point in that location. So when people are coming from the corner, they can see that focal point and we attract them to explore this path uh, below the building. So we don't want it to people to feel like that even though that's open, it's still like, is this public? Is this private? Like, can I walk below here? So the idea was to make that feel like that's part of the city uh, grid and people can just walk through and see, get touch this mural, things like that. Adam, do you want to just kind of hit it, talk over the high points of this plan? Sure. Uh, I briefly mentioned, you know, some plantings that we're doing on the Meadow Street side, uh, particularly the, you know, low-level uh, evergreen shrub uh, with some some reed grass and some of those decorative grasses that are uh, primarily going to be salt tolerant. But we can we can talk more about uh, planting selection. But that's generally been our approach uh, for the uh, Meadow Street side. Um, we are showing some uh, a different variety of shrubs as you turn the corner from the Meadow Street to that back, um, I guess, the north side of the main building there where the bike path, bike garage, or bike garage, the bike storage area is going to be. Um, there's some shrubs down that way. Um, not, not quite that far up, Steve, where the, the bike locker is going to be. Are you in here? Uh, down where the, so if you're turning, if you're going north on Meadow and you turn the corner on the building there. Oh, right, here. right in there. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, so we have a mixture of some low level use and some sumax in that area. Um, and then as we proceed up both flanks of the building, you know, there's some question, I think Lisa asked a question of what we're doing along the flanks and we're going to just be doing some, you know, a stone mulch area there. Um, along those perimeter areas, um, and then we get to the north side of the of the building, where there's going to be a small patio area for folks to recreate and uh, and hang out. Uh, we're having some you know some uh, hydrangeas and some reed grasses and and other plantings in that area to kind of spruce that up. Um, the fire lane itself would consist of uh, I believe we've settled on a stamped concrete pattern uh, that's going to be dyed, uh, and those provisions are. Uh, outlined in the plans. It's going to be basically a dark gray um, slate um, stamped concrete pattern for both the patio area and the portion of the fire lane that's on this property. And lastly, the areas along the sides, the perimeter there, that uh, there's some areas that do have fencing there now. I believe the new development to the north has some black vinyl coated chain link fence along portions of this property line uh, what we're going to do is is close in the gaps for you know simply just for site security uh, close in the gaps where there are any uh, with you know similar black vinyl coated chain link fence along those areas as well okay and adam when you were talking about the the north end i i should have had this slide up oh sure that's okay yeah uh, so there on, on the left side you see the stamped concrete pattern uh, with the dyed color um, the fence that's in that image there at the upper left is an existing fence that borders uh, along the project's northern face. That's going to remain. Um, and then on the western edge with the chain link fence, again, that's where we're going to be matching the, uh, the black vinyl coated in those areas, as well as some areas on the east side adjacent to, to that neighboring building as well. We'll have some patio seating out there, whether it's uh, the table and chairs or the picnic table. You know, those are the styles of the, the seating uh, that we'd be looking to, to put out on that north side as well. And as far as the seating along the Meadow Street side, uh, I believe it's generally what you're going to be seeing there on the right side uh, for those areas. And we were very intentional with the type of stamped concrete on the top uh, north. So we we wanted to feel like that's not like um, um, a fire lane. Even like we want it to be functional as a fire lane, but if someone is sitting there, the stamped concrete will be kind of like in the whole area and feel a bit more pleasant um, in that space. 
and I I think the last the last thing that I'll I'll mention is that we did reach out. To, so uh, Vism has been working. We, we've been reporting on this over the last couple of months, and I think uh, Lisa has rightly so been saying we need to touch base with the uh, fire department and the fire marshal. Um, we we are ready. With, we are ready with a draft to have that meeting with the fire department. We reached out to them today and got a response that. Um, so that meeting should be happening very soon, hopefully, uh, you know, within the week, the next week. And, um, you know, they did say that their concerns would be that we just reach an agreement on how um, how we maintain that lane. And um, and that will be our discussion about that. But uh, we haven't spoken with them yet, but we will get that on the books very shortly. And in parallel, um, we already spoke uh, with TCA. Um, the person in charge was out of the office for a bit, but um, I believe there are no concerns with the proposed easement. They are reviewing it with the attorneys. So I think this would be something that we would be signing pretty soon, I hope. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'll remind the board that our action for today focuses on returning to part three, but we've seen a lot of stuff that is not that. So before we dive in, uh, I do want to make sure that we get a chance to respond to what we've seen. Um, Emily, could I start with you? Sure, thank you. I am super excited about this project now. I, I think in the past presentations, I was kind of waiting for this design development to happen, and I think it happened. We'll see what everyone else says. But um, that move on the first floor is awesome. It really opens up the corner and makes this a place that people are going to gather and go to. Um, I love those vertical blades and the cut in the building. It, it, there's not a lot of, <clears throat> I suppose, depth other than those, but they give you a lot of bang for your buck, I think, and, and really work. And the Nietzsche Hot panels, I know it's a quality product. The gradation of reveal on those panels is cool. So um, a thumbs up for me on the design development this week. I hope that the rest of the building develops to a similar level, and that'll be interesting to see um, as we move along, that's all I have. Thank you guys so much. Daniel. Yeah, I think um, similarly, very excited about this project. Um, I think this angle in particular does a great job at showing how how much this intersection could transform with added density and the right, correct, like the right way of um, introducing activity at the street level. Um, more retail, more density. I think seeing pronounced crosswalks makes it seem like this is a much more walkable avenue. And I think it will be once this is finished. I think the color palette is great. I think the bold colors are awesome. I would love to see um, a similarly detailed rendering um, from the other uh, end of the street, including the building that um, the citizen would be essentially hugging, right? I think contextually it, it does matter. Um, and I agree that it makes sense to have less pronounced different uh, color palette um, in the recessed part of the building, but um, overall, really, really great and, and very excited for this one. CJ. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, yeah, I think visually it's really interesting. I'm kind of curious about why. I've always wanted to know, you know, what's with all the bollards uh, here on the corner? I'm just curious about that, but um, I see there's a lot of questions uh, that are still unanswered uh, from city engineering about the entrances and such. And so I'm just kind of curious about, you know, how that would impact the design here in terms of a really critical juncture. So I'm really curious to hear uh, more about that. And I think it's really come along. I'm concerned, obviously, that there's um, you know, some pretty significant limitations based on the engineering concerns. Um, the project. So, thanks. Thanks, CJ. Elizabeth. Thanks, guys, for the uh, presentation. This building is really looking sharp. I like the setback on the ground floor, but I do need some clarification on the material of those exposed columns. They don't look great to me um, compared to the rest of the quality and the palette of the building. Did you say that was split face bloxy? Um, if I said split face, I meant ground face because I do think that um, ground and, and it's not rendering well. I I don't disagree with you. It doesn't look great in the rendering. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I just think that those corners look really sharp and with all the other materials and then having like CMU there, whether it is ground face or split face, I don't know. I don't know what other solutions there might be or if you can even have just like tube steel, painted tube steel or I don't something else in there. It just looks really scale wise, it looks really thick and chunky. Um, the other thing is uh, what CJ mentioned about the white bollards, the steel bollards, there might be another solution for that as well, because it doesn't look like the bollards along the um, sidewalk. They don't look like they match the rest of the building palette. Um, those blades look awesome. Um, I actually really like the neon green. Uh, makes the building kind of stand out. And um, I love those panels. Please don't turn them into ethos. <laughs> and Laura, I absolutely love the idea of public art. I think I mentioned that in every single project. And that mural um, with the mosaic would look fantastic in that corner. So I hope you can make it happen. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Mitch. Well, it looks great. Thanks for the development of the ground floor. I think you really got it. Uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, I think the green blades are doing a lot of work for you here. Like if, I'm trying to imagine that building without them and it's pretty much a, a gray block. And so I just wonder if you might do some color variation on the sides that are not the projected corner so that the corner kind of sticks out in terms of a hierarchy. We don't have much hierarchy in the, in the coloration here. You could address that. And then seeing also how it works its way down towards the north end of the building and seeing more design development that's similar to what Emily uh, mentioned but um yeah it looks like it's coming along thanks could could I just just so that I make sure I understood that, that you said the corners that aren't the side projections Mitch could you what we what did you mean there the area over the garage and the area north of the inset uh to the north um you know how it looks like there's a cube on the corner that you're trying to project a little bit as the entry or the community facing corner of the building. Ah. And then there's the wings that are not that. So there, there could be a hierarchy in terms of a subtle color. If those are lighter or some other, you know, it just, yeah. it just looks pretty relentless as a gray, similarly colored block the whole way around. So I'm just trying to ask for some options in terms of uh, creating a hierarchy in the facade. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Garrick. Pretty much concur with everyone else. Um, I love the corner and how you've opened it up. And what I like about it is how activating that streetscape makes that look like a city corner as opposed to the edge of a state highway, mm -hmm. which I think we really, really need. So I, I welcome that. Um, I love the fins. And uh, I guess mural is not a signage package per se, but I, I love the idea of a sign or a symbol that conveys actual meaning rather than uh, kind of a gimmick we've seen. Uh, so I think this is really, really great. Thank you, Garrett. Um, the only thing I'll add, and you, you zoomed in at a good time, um, is that you know this is another predominantly gray building that we're looking at with a bright blue sky that is not reflective of current conditions. So I'd like to see future renderings on this show it with the gray sky. Um, but you know, you've got color now, so that'll fix it. Um, and with that, I think it would be good to dive into the beef. Um, and I do have in my notes here that we do need responses to city engineer. And as we raise beef concerns, uh, perhaps we can hear about that as well. Uh, Lisa, do you have something? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say it was so helpful to see this rendering and uh, and so helpful to see how it fit into the context. And I think because of the extreme proximity to the other land uses around it, particularly the small, I think we need to see this from different angles around the building um, and any maybe not to, but this was really, really helpful. So um, different, uh, different views from the back, how it's going to look from the back, where the other houses are and the other residences and um, the and should also to from the north. Thank you. Excellent.
Um, so that does bring it to the thief. I'd actually like to ask Nikki to help us see where we should be focused. Sure. Um, and for time's sake, I think we just focus on impacts on plants and animals like we had. I, we just we definitely need to know the tree species. You have given us deviate, it's great. You need to know what species there are existing. Um, and that planting plan and schedule, which I think I just got materials before this meeting, but I think you may have included that in those, so that's great. Um, and, it, and as CJ and Rob have mentioned, really the engineering, transportation, um, page five and six, there are some really big questions that your whole project kind of relies on. And one of those is the garage entrance on Buffalo. Um, I mean, personally, I ate at the milk stand last weekend and just looking at that project site, um, it is really close to the intersection where that garage is the, you know, coming in and coming out. So really need some information on that. And I think you might have done a, a, some kind of traffic plan. I think you might have just sent that, but um, really answering these questions for engineering on page five and six. Mm -hmm. um, and your project, you know, it hinges on these being answered. All right, thank you, Nikki. Yeah, and then sorry, no. <laughs> say on page eight. Um, and this is getting back to what um, Lisa mentioned, Daniel mentioned. Um, I, I love this streetscape too. Thank you so much. It looks so activated. Green it. That's my little landscape piece. Green it. If you're putting those green fins on, put as much green in there as you can. People are going to love to be there. And it looks already activated, so I love it. Um, but again, from the other angles, especially I keep seeing that little tiny house to the west. <laughs> I really want to see if anything's happening to make it feel not so tiny. And um, so, yeah, the other angles. And that really is part of the feed as far as like consistency with community care. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Nikki. That's helpful. Um, so I kind of feel like Nikki covered it, but you know, it is our job to read this and flag concerns. Um, and so this is our opportunity to do so. Uh, this will, project will be back before us. Um, we will see it again and talk about the feet again. Um, and we don't need a response to any of this right now, but if any of this is you know, something that you wanted to respond to right now, Steve, that would be fine. Um, I No, I, do, I don't think so. I think they're all... Um, I would add that the bollards are existing. Yes, um, thank you, Laura. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They bother me a bit too, but they are yeah. existing. And I, I suspect it's primarily to protect the existing building and ultimately they're gonna be this building from larger trucks or even just vehicles in general as they turn left onto Buffalo from Meadow Street. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, CJ. So, I was just, so those ballers are going to stop a truck? Okay. Yeah. Very. <laughs> they do, but we could replace them. Be okay, right. stainless steel. So just um, you know, I don't mean to harp on this, but you know, I'm seeing things like too close. Consider eliminating, and I'm just not. Maybe I'm not getting like this substantive meaning behind it because I'm reading the sentences and I'm like, oh, well, they're asking for a complete project redesign. And You're talking about the engineering comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I get the you know I understand DOT probably has one position and you know the city. Perhaps the position is more urban. I, I don't even know, um, but I'm just seeing these comments and they seem like a significant funding factor. And I just uh, want to know. Uh, yep. If I could just touch on those real quick, just, just real briefly, we, we have responded uh, back to the city engineer's uh, comments. Um, I think there might have been a misunderstanding as to what was how the how the northern driveway, which is the fire lane, was to be functioning um, and that there is really no means or provision for through traffic for tenants to be using uh, the parking garage and the, the parking garage specifically is only going to be used for the residential tenant so the 25 spaces that are there are only for the residential tenants not for the commercial ground floor space so we're not providing any any off-street parking for the for the ground floor uh, commercial spaces uh, we've also made the provision for the exiting traffic to be a right out only from the garage, not attempting to make a left. Um, you know, again, there is the, the existing driveway that's there now. Um, we will we'll be reusing it. We're maintaining similar sight lines as what's out there right now. 
Uh, we have submitted the initial plans uh, along with the chip generation memo to DOT. We're waiting on their feedback. Um, you know, so I think in general, we have responded to the city engineer's comments. Ultimately, we need to have their buy-in, but we have we have resubmitted. And we also need to see those. So we need to please submit those to us. Do you hear that? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, anything else from border staff on this project today? Seeing none, I'd like to thank the applicant, and uh, we're excited to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Hey, thank, thank you all. You. Have a great night. Next up, we have Squeaky Clean Car Wash. Yeah, um, a couple later. Yeah. See, do we have everyone we need? Or are we still waiting on people? Oh, now we're all here. Good evening. Great. Take it away, please. Good evening. Uh, David Herrick with T.G. Miller. Uh, Gary Sloan, the applicant, uh, Margot Chutin, uh, landscape architect, and John Snyder, uh, architect for the project. Uh, we know that uh, the focus tonight is is on the uh, part three and the consideration of the uh, secret resolution. Uh, we did provide uh, some additional material, which I'm prepared to share with you if you'd like to see that first, or uh, we could simply jump into uh, discussion on the uh, Proposed resolution, if you like. Oh, why don't you show us what you have, please? Very good. The uh, message was clear uh, from several PRC and planning board uh, presentations that uh, uh, you wanted to see full landscaping along Meadow Street. And so uh, Margo has uh, done just that. And we've provided in this uh, rendered site plan and in the technical uh, planting plan the details that uh, fully vegetate the entire frontage um, along uh, South Meadow Street. Uh, also, we have, uh, in addition to rendering the landscaping along the street, we've now started to really refine uh, through John the, the exterior architecture. Uh, John, you can speak to these uh, elevations if you like, but one thing I'll point out uh, that came out of uh, PRC last was an interest in understanding how the signage uh, might play out uh, relative to uh, uh, pylon sign and also to building mounted sign. And the renderings that we're sharing with you tonight reflect uh, the proposed sign package, which uh, uh, has been prepared by uh, Gary's consultant uh, in conformance with the SW2 uh, signage requirements. Uh, and John, is there anything that you'd like to share or Gary that you'd like to uh, explain relative to the, the facade materials? I'm not hearing John. Hello. Well, let's, uh, I guess we'll just, we'll just continue along here. Uh, there were a number of other uh, technical drawings that uh, we put together that uh, helped in, in responding to some questions that were part of uh, the, the part three uh, FEAF. And I have those available if we need to go to them, but uh, uh, I guess at this point, unless there's uh, any uh, additional comments that either uh, Gary Margo or, or John would like to share, we can uh, move into the consideration of the secret resolution. Uh, so if you guys are done with your presentation, thank you very much. Um, before we move towards the part three, uh, I just, I'm not going to go around the room, but I do want to open the floor for any member of the board or staff to react to anything we've seen today before we get into the, you know, the tech. 
Seeing none. Oh yeah, Mitch. Uh, we're responding to what we just saw. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just looking at the landscape plan, I'm just wondering, uh, and the rendering, thanks. I think it's coming along. Just wondering if there could be an additional tree on the Meadow Street side. Um, there are two trees that are probably 100 feet apart, I think, mm -hmm. if I'm getting the scale right. Um, there's definitely space for another one. Um, so just think about that. The other part of it for me is the signage. Um, is there going to be a pole sign here? And if there is, uh, I'd like to see it. I'm not sure what the zoning says about that, but I think it would not be good to have a large pole sign right at that corner um, of Meadow. Don't have to answer that right now. And also, I think um, it relates to the signage on the building, if there is one or if there isn't one. Um, and also the um, masonry part of the building. I looked at your uh, facility up in, in uh, on Trip Hammer, and it, there's some nice brick detailing of that, brick around the base. There's actually brick on one, one end of the building, and I think more brick in this building would be better. And also uh, lightening the blue and having more of a gray color. It's pretty electric right now. And I noticed the building up in uh, Lansing is, is pretty subdued, and it's pretty nice in terms of the street presence. Mm -hmm. Those are the comments I have. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, any other comments what we've seen so far uh, today? Emily. Yeah, hi, thank you for these updated renderings. Um, I was thinking about the signage package as well. Um, assuming that there was no full sign since I don't see it, I was going to say that this sign package seems like a more modest one than the other locations, which I appreciate in relation to the residential neighborhood nearby. <coughs> um, and so if what we're seeing is accurate for the sign package, I'm curious about which ones are illuminated. Um, it seems like they're all facing um, the 13, which is a good idea, but that would be Nice to understand next time if there's any illuminated signs facing the residential. Um, and then I, I agree with Mitch about the brick. Um, and I was thinking like a slightly more navy, not not to the gray, but like a navy blue. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can't micromanage that much. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think the trim and the color and the detailing is feeling really residential, and that that looks great. All right. Any uh, further responses to what we've seen today? Um, I, I agree on more brick. Um, I personally like the color. Clearly, there's a lot of opinions here, but you know, but I, I do think it looks good, and, and the additional landscape looks awesome. I think it's going to look great on that corner. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, anything else? All right, I am going to open it up to the uh, the part three, um, and assuming we're comfortable, we'll eventually look for a motion for the seeker resolution of this course. Um, there are hopefully some highlights in the part three uh, to find the things that are potentially problematic. Um, and I would actually like to, to lead us off on the, the highlighted section on part seven. It's about noise. Um, so I understand that there was concern about the noise from the vacuums brought up in PRC. I unfortunately wasn't able to attend. Uh, and then this and highlighted, I understand, is the response from the applicant about the the vacuums and the noise you know that will be resulting from them um and i'll say that I, it's not this to me does not constitute a, a quantitative response to a noise concern i mean i i understand that you know these are the same vacuums used elsewhere and there haven't been complaints elsewhere um but to me this is a fairly different environment and I would love to see either some, some specs or some shielding strategy or some something uh, that would indicate to me that the applicant is taking the noise concern seriously. Because I, I, to me, this response doesn't do it. Okay. Um, do you want us to respond now or wait till you're done? Yeah. Do you, you um, should we respond? Um, you want, I mean, well, why don't why, if it's okay we can respond to if you have concern. something that would be concern. fine uh so mm -hmm. if you have if you have something something to say about noise that would be fine i'll say that you know the the kind of response i'm looking for i don't know can be ad-libbed on the fly but you know if you if you have something to share i'd certainly hear it hey, what i do um so one of the things that uh, I did, and I, David, I believe I provided you with some information on this. So I went to the uh, 
a 377 Elmira Road site. And um, we, um, I had a, a decimometer um, that we had purchased and it's not an inexpensive one, a really good one to get good readings. Um, and I turned all six vacuums on um, and then I moved 20 feet, 30 feet into the property line. And we weren't exceeding anywhere over 90, I can tell you that, uh, much below that. The only time that I uh, read 90 is when a truck went by and blew his brakes out on Route 13. It spiked to 90 for one second, and then I came back down into the 60, 70 range. So um, I did do that. Um, I did it on the front of the building. I did it on the exit end of the building and also on the vacuum end. And I just like the, the board to realize that we've never really had any noise complaints about the vacuums because they're just not that that loud. Um, we have two neighbors directly behind us uh, at the 377 Elmira Road site. Um, they're pretty close to us and there's never been a noise concern. So I do, I do appreciate that context. Um, other questions and comments about the part three? Otherwise, I can ask uh, Nikki to lead us to relevant sections. <laughs> Nikki, could you help us? <laughs> sure. Um, I think and there's only other two other highlighted areas. Um, six is just their answer to one of the comments from city engineering and whether you think that that is enough um, of a mitigation. So the highlight is their answer to it. Yeah, the no right turn. Mm -hmm. um, is the no right turn where we ended up? I, I remember an expansive conversation about <laughs> how we were going to manage this. And I remember no right turn was part of it. Yes. Um, is is yeah. that it? Yeah. Okay. And we will certainly submit the no right turn with the uh, remainder of the sign package. And then number eight is also towards that future clothing of South Pettis. Correct. Um, Emily. Possibly this could have to do with what we're talking about on page six. I remember a discussion of how internally the applicant plans to create two lanes when there's extra traffic flow, you know, on the site to manage so there's no buildup of traffic back into the neighborhood. We document that. I feel like that's what's yep. getting yeah. And we'll we'll stripe that way. Um, and if you if we go back and just take a look at the uh, site plan, you can see there's ample room to do that. So sure. internally, we'll stripe that and have arrows and all of, all of that. Um, Lisa, did you have something? Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering if yeah, it's sort of related to this. I'm just wondering if it would make sense to have a fence. Mm -hmm to screen the parking lot, the vacuums, the light and everything mm -hmm. from Six Mile Creek and the neighbors across along, you know, north of your north of your access driveway, you know, some way to just screen all of that. Um, you know. I think, you know, because they're not going to be looking at a building. They're kind of looking at back of house. And um, I think some kind of fence that, you know, maybe modulates in, in height in order to not just could be a really positive thing for dealing with some of the issues moving light in this. So um, I know it can be hard to hear uh, sometimes. Do you catch all that from Lisa? We're looking potentially for screening strategies or fencing strategies. Uh, along the tightest frontage, sort of between the entrance heading towards Meadow Street, um, you know, possibly as a way to mitigate light and noise. Uh, does the applicant have an initial reaction to that? <coughs> well, it would, we, we we haven't even thought about um, that. No, we, we we haven't thought about it. Uh, it. It's it's physically possible to do it if it's something that. Uh, I'd be concerned about, you know, a solid fence, you know, creating more of a security issue. People can hide behind, you know, I think in terms of security in that, just 
you know, in the setting, you really want to be able to have clear lines of sight, you know, no pockets where people can hide out. Um, and I would think, you know, that sort of level of safety would probably trump any sort of visual impact, you know, that you would have towards the Titus um, street. I, I would point out too that, that between the site and North Titus, which is the, the nearest residence there, um, there is vegetative growth on both banks, on both sides of the creek. Um, so it, it's not, while in wintertime you, you don't have uh, uh, foliage, but uh, during the uh, growing season, you do have two creek uh, embankments that are quite vegetated with mature vegetation. So there is, uh, there is that level of screening. And normally in all of our zones, you need to screen your parking lot residential areas or and from just in general and this because it's different i'm just saying maybe we can keep talking about it yeah i mean i think we could take it down in site plan um yeah. that's basically where i'm at with the vacuums too like i think that you know maybe we need to see specs at some point but we can see that there's a site plan review okay um, okay any other outstanding concerns in the part three <laughs> CJ and Elizabeth, can I check in with you about anything? Yeah, we were just um, saying, just kind of echoing what Lisa was saying. There's seems to be some fencing around the trash enclosure. And perhaps that could be just bring there. So, okay. Yeah, and there will be there. Yep. Any questions or comments on the part three? Is anyone not comfortable with uh, moving towards the seeker resolution? Um, well, I'm just, Lisa. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we oh, could yeah. just say, you know, and sometimes you do this, if there's something you want to continue to explore during site plan review, yeah. not that you have to have it in here, mm -hmm. but, you know, with noise complaints, you know, you can say we can board will continue to explore ways to mitigate noise and light impact during site plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, what's that about? Yeah, yeah. And you can add that anywhere know that you haven't fully you've gotten to a level where you feel like it's you're okay but you still want to work on it. Yeah let's add some more language with the um with the screening. I mean I think it goes right there in that same spot yeah. on noise odor and light. Mm -hmm. You know okay. yeah. we're exploring ways to yeah you should really look at the lighting you know really look at the lighting sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think those are good edits. Uh, I appreciate the time spent on the part three. Is there a motion for the seeker negative declaration that is before us? I see Elizabeth move. I see Emily second. Um, before we go into a vote, is there any discussion on that resolution? Seeing none, uh, I am gonna go straight into a vote. Garrick? Yes. Mitch? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. CJ? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Emily? Yes. I am also a yes. You have your neck deck. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate the time tonight, and we will see you again soon, I have no doubt. Yes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That brings it to the William. Thank you. Yeah, you know, in there, but I mean, Jason, but he is here. Mm -hmm. You know, where he is, Chris, is he? I just texted him. He's not in the waiting room or anywhere. That's it. He disappeared. Oh, there he is. There we go. <laughs>
Can you guys hear me? Yeah. I'm having some uh, computer issues. So hopefully it, I don't think my video is working. Um, it isn't. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, are you able to move forward? Can you share your screen? Uh, it's it's spool in here. Uh, I might have to restart my computer. Um, uh, okay. We can now move. We could go on to yeah. zoning appeals while you're getting organized, and then come yeah. Back. Let me let me restart, and I'll ju I'll jump back. Great. All right. So we'll we'll leave you for a moment, and we'll take down the zoning appeals. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's do everything but the green star variants. Um, I will have to recuse myself when we get there, but you know we'll we'll see what we can get through uh, while we're waiting. First up is Cornell Media Guild and area variance on six hundred four East Buffalo Street. My understanding is this is an area variance driven by parking. Um, yes, please. In fact, if you wanted to, you can just walk us through okay. the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Yes, and let me know if you have questions. Um, so this is a parking variance, that's right, Rob. Um, there's one space provided on site, and evidently they've been granted three different variances in different years, but the one that's really pertinent to this was granted in 2012, um, where the BZA allowed them to uh, have a variance for three spots on the grounds that they then leased three spots at another location. Mm -hmm. And now they're coming back and they don't want to do that anymore. They don't want to lease the three spots. and Part of the reasoning is COVID happened. There's not a lot of full-time employees anymore. Um, and we also got a public comment that's, I don't know if you read that, but they're in favor of this variance. Um, but that is what I know with this variance, or the summary for this variance. Um, so any questions or comments on that variance? Any reactions from members of the board? No physical change here. We're talking no about physical just change. The lease arrangement. Yep. So they wouldn't be required to lease three spaces anymore. So things we could say is there are no physical changes enabled by this variance, and so the planning impacts are minimal. We could say something about parking, and that we don't think that this is going to be a problem. We generally support reduction in parking. We do. Um, anything else more specific we want to say on this? Seeing some shaking heads. Do you need anything else? Should we move on? Right, that's great. Great. And next one up is Crescent Place. This one. Is keep my on. And this one is basically demolishing an existing garage, which you can see on the survey, which is about 11 feet by 19 feet. And they want to replace it with a 14 by 22 garage in a similar location. Um, and this triggers a few variances um, a rear yard, a side yard, and then also the percent block coverage by a building from 25% to 26.3. If you know the minimum is 20, the maximum is 25. This would make it 26.3. And some of the reasoning is you can see on this drawing, they want to keep it lined up with the driveway. That's part of it. And then they also want it bigger to fit modern cars, et cetera. So that green is the new garage proposal. We could say we wish it was an ADU, but beyond that, like I'm not sure that there's a whole lot to say. Um, yeah, thoughts? As far as the owner uses that are enhanced, right? Like everyone should have the ability to have a garage on the side of my house. Okay. Improvement to the property. Oh, improvement to the property, that's better. And minimal land use impact. Minimal land use impact. Rear yard. 
All right, so I hear we support this uh, because we support owner investments and property improvements with minimal land use impacts and see no long term planning impact. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, I'm going to skip Green Star because I have to leave the room. And there's an extra one uh, called Seven Cell Towers, which is probably not actually called that. <laughs> so, uh, this is, um, all right. So, I'm happy to well, actually let me let me pull up. Uh, Okay, so this is a map. Every one of those pins is a location of a new small cell um, facility, which is a which consists of an antenna, transmission equipment, uh, electric um, equipment, and they're all mounted on either existing or replacements in the same location. I say utility. Um, so they back. You know, we, this is the first type of um, application like this we've gotten where it's like seven locations, um, small cell on uh, utility poles. And um, they, because of some recent changes to our ordinance in the last few years, they all require variances because our ordinance does not allow new um, new cell phone, new cell, new cell facilities within 250 feet of the residence. So, um, this, yeah, so these all need a variance for that. They look like, let me just show you what they look like. Those are the locations. There's seven of them. Only six there. Only six there. Yeah. Only two of them. Oh, maybe there's six. <laughs> um, so it, this is. This is it. It's a it's on an existing or replacement pole. It is an antenna up top and a, a cabinet and a meter on the bottom. Um, typically, what it will look like this will be uh, the bottom of this box is about eight feet from the ground. And the bottom of the meter is five feet from the ground in, an ex in a tree lawn on an existing. So can I ask what the intention of the ordinance is? Because I am fine with these cell towers, but clearly we have an ordinance against them. And I can't tell if it's for real reasons or woo-woo reasons. Um, and it, like, like I, I, I don't know how to interpret what we're supposed to do. Well, um, the ordinance was, you know, I think we're in between, the ordinance was, um, I mean, think anticipating 5G and, um, and, but then when it was written, it was written to apply to everything. So you know, the, the city can't, uh, when an applicant applies for a, one of these facilities, we can't, you know, the FCC is the one that regulates the radio waves and, you know, the correct equipment and the city only has so much authority. Mm -hmm. So um, we can look at the design of it and we can look at the location of it to a certain extent, but if the location then prevents them from achieving their coverage goals that they're allowed. They get to do it anyway. It's difficult to deny them. Okay. So, yeah, I-, I, I there has been public comment about it, um, not for this particular one, but there were there are two. There are two that are um oh the seven twenty dollar yeah oh sorry so it just went down oops <laughs> so yeah the seventh one is up here that's right it's in the historic district so there's two there's one right near. Uh, Fall Creek Elementary School, which must be this one. And then there's one on Utica Street, which must be that one. Um, do they make noise? Was one of the do they make noise? I mean, there's no noise. Mm -hmm. uh, are they uh, carrier specific? This is yes, a, this is 18. Only 18. Yeah, 18. So they would be applying for variance from the distance requirements. This strikes me as a zoning board problem and that we don't have to say anything. 
They, yeah, they, yeah, they do require limited site plan review, which I do on an administrative level. Okay. Great. Does anyone have anything they would like to say or have the board say in response to this, this application? Emily. Sorry to belabor this. Is, if this is carrier specific, do we run the risk of having these all over everywhere from all the other carriers? And is that, does that become a problem? Or are we okay? Um, other carriers will, yes. I mean, other, there. well, you know, it's, very, it's interesting. If you go out and look at the utility poles, there's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. on the utility poles. All right. Um, so yes, other carriers would likely come in, and then when they come in, we also our ordinance also looks at um, one thing that you get that is preferred is if they're co-located, so having the same carrier on the same utility pole. If they're all on utility poles, then you're adding things to something that's already there that's already preferred. But then if you're adding stuff, adding something to a utility pole that already has something on it, that is also preferred. So, so we have safeguards. Okay. Yeah, we do have some safeguards. Just add, just looking at plan Ethica, I mean, there's there are tie-ins to sections four, five, and six, economic vitality, livability, mobility, and transportation. All those things are enabled by good communications. So I think we just make a general statement that improving trans, uh, communication infrastructure is in keeping with the plan. Okay. Uh, does anybody not want to say that? Elizabeth. I do not want to say that. <laughs> you want to elaborate? <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll say that I am totally and completely ambivalent on this one and would be comfortable saying something like Garrett said or nothing at all. I don't think it matters. I all right. So unless there is a strong push in this room to say something, I'm going to say we say nothing. Lisa, is there any problem we're going to run into here? Just say nothing. Just say nothing. I don't think there's a problem. We reviewed and we have no comment on this particular. Great. That's Same. where I'm at. Um, okay. So I think that takes care of that. We do have one variance left. I am going to re leave the room uh, for that one. Before I leave the room, I'll disclose, disclose that I am a boy of Green Star. I have intentionally avoided any information about this particular sign package. Uh, and I won't say anything else. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, and Garrick, do you mind uh, seven in? Oh, um, actually, I do. Yeah, I don't mind. I'm not sorry, you moving to what? Oh, yeah, I guess so. Sure, sure. Thanks. Sure. You understand? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is Green Star, um, and it's for signs. Oops, we're not looking. We're not seeing. You know, I'm trying. Yeah, I was kidding. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> this is for Green Star, and it's for signs. So the um, top sign that you're seeing with the with the tomato, and then the, the Green Star with the tomato and the other one. Um, those two are okay with the sign variants. You're allowed to have two within this zone, um, and then it's the bottom signs down down there in the four that they're counting, I believe as two. So it would be four in total and also more square footage. So they're asking for permission for those bottom signs of the apple that you see in the eggs. The images? And the, so, yeah, the yeah, images, exactly. Because, it, because yeah. they're images of things that they sell, they're considered two. Mm -hmm. And there's mm -hmm. something like, yeah, yeah, max of two signs are asking for yeah. four. And then the square footage is a little bit over as well. Um, it's supposed to be 60 square feet of signage in that zone, and this is 73.2. Mm -hmm. Okay. Section four, economic vitality. Yeah, I think it has vitality. I'm more concerned about the, the informal signs that are taped to the wall that are more distracting to me than the actual one. Yeah, like they, used, they, they didn't they, do they a, a uh, permit for that one. Yeah. <laughs> right? like, you should prevent that. I think everything else is perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> the actual, you know, vibrancy of the the signs. Yeah. Look good. Okay. I just also point out. No, I, um, I mean, this location has suffered immensely 
from the street being closed for months and months and months. But I think if anyone deserves to be given a little bit of a break, it's this location. Either way. Yeah. Absolutely fine. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. All right there. Is that the other people online? Jason, are they working? Not there. There you are. Yep. Should be working. Great. So if you would, Jason, please introduce yourself and take it away. All right. Jason Demarest, architect for Adbro Development, uh, 108, 110 College Ave. Uh, the project is uh, the William. I've seen it before. I'm sharing my screen now. Um, I'll just jump in, you know, 34 unit apartment building redevelopment, site. Um, but I think the focus is really um, the sunken patios on the front and uh, the exterior lighting. So I was just going to jump into those to give you an update on a few little minor changes to that. So um, what I have here is the ex the previous rendering from, from last month and then... Um, and the new one, what I've, what I've done, you might not quite see that, but the courtyard walls have, have dropped to open them up a little bit and um, 18 inches. And so the landscaping um, uh, is dropping a little bit there, but let me just uh, uh, go through a little bit. Um, so this is the previous rendering. Uh, I've, I've now shifted the the lighting really just to light up the landscaping and to downlight it rather than up light, which is a common way to, to light up the landscaping. Um, so you can see a subtle wash on the building um, that's toned down. It's really directed more <laughs> straight down rather than angled in a little to, to wash the building. So very subtle light. Um, we just think it will, you know, you think about this time of year, you know, it's dark, um, you know, in the, the late afternoon really, um, it just it just would add add character and and some safety to to the uh, the building. And then this is not the kind of lighting that needs to stay on overnight. It's a it's an accent light, so you know we'd be open to um, you know talking about that. Um, and so I'll just run through some of the renderings before and then after. You can see the the bush in the foreground just dropping down. Um, just the front entry, everything's sunk in just a little bit. But I want to move a little, a little faster through this just to get to the the patios. Um, that's the back doesn't change, <clears throat> and so you can see here now the um, the patios up front before. Let me go back. So before and after, um, and and then here's a overhead straight on view so before and after so it's very subtle change but the big impact is um the patio here is uh just brings those walls down and makes it a little bit um a little bit nicer uh, down in those areas um I, we do think this will be a nice amenity space um you know rather than just having a window wells um you know it's a place to to get outside and you know have a table in the nice season and you know um hang out outside so so that's really the change um i can show you some of the basis of that i've shown this before this is actually it's a document out of the Catherine commons proposal but they're referencing 119 to 125 college ave 238 linden um and then um here's that um you know this is literally right across the street so they've basically filled up the front yard with with stoops and sunken access ways um so it's actually the character of the neighborhood now um so that that's really 
where that came from. And, you know, there is obviously the, the economic argument to, uh, we need to get those, um, lower apartments to make the, the project work. Um, so, um, kind of like this, uh, this bird's eye view here, um, a little bit more room in this, uh, inner courtyard. It has like an extra three foot shelf in there. And that's because of the indent in the building. Um, so I think, I think maybe I'll leave it at that is for the design updates. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's get a quick reaction. Uh, what we've seen, uh, I'm not going to do roll call, but anyone who wishes to have questions or comments on the presentation, otherwise we'll get into the part three. Uh, I, a quick comment about the sunken courtyards. I mean, it's a slope, they kind of are what they are. Um, they're certainly better this way, but for the ones uh, that that basically have the um, balcony in the upstairs apartment right above them, it would be worth exploring some kind of a more translucent uh, balcony surface material um, to allow light in because essentially you have it, it almost entirely covered. Um, there's a way of doing this at an angle where you prevent um, uh, ups, upskirting, as they call it, or you know, it, was, it can be very controversial. Um, uh, but yeah, otherwise you have this a sunken courtyard with yeah. I hadn't seen that degree of detail, but I, that 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 does it too. Other questions and comments, Lisa? Yeah, I just want to. Um just point out again the idea of lighting the actual walls of the building and how you know just cautioning us to if you're going to go in that direction that you're going to see a lot more of that and is that something we want to see in residential neighborhoods is there value to it and anyway elizabeth i'm torn about that because normally we wouldn't want any extra lighting but in trying to walk that area after five in the winter, like I didn't feel very safe because I couldn't see two feet in front of me. Like we don't have a lot of good um, street lighting at all. Right now there's no surfaces. lighting there because everything's been removed, that there will be lighting. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't mean just that street. Mm -hmm. I mean, any other streets in that neighborhood all the way to Bell Sherman. Even if you walk Dryden, you know, it's not that well lit. So I'm torn about that. Like I said, typically we wouldn't want to see that kind of lighting, but in just ambient lighting might help um, at the street level. Yeah. Agreed. Gary, you have something? I say I agree. I think that's right. Any other questions or comments on what we've seen today? Emily. I would love to revisit a plan of the the lowest level where these sunken courtyards exist. Floor plan? What's that? You mean a floor plan? Yeah, a floor plan. Um, because, and my question is, do any apartments only have this courtyard as the, the means of light, vent, and egress? I figure the ones in the north and the south probably have other, I see other windows. But maybe the middle one only has that. And I, I just don't know that I can get on board with an apartment at that location, looking at a concrete wall below ground. I, despite the economics of it, I think it's a, it's a bad model to set precedent in college soon. So the studios concern you? I think that's the... I think the studios, yeah, are the most concerning because the only exterior source of light is on that second quarter. I mean, so, is that even a second quarter or is it just a white wall in that location? No, it's a quarter. Or, or balcony. So then I guess that question for the studio is how do you get out of the sunken courtyard as a second point of egress? Could, 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 that, could the studio be in addition to the two bedrooms, make it a three bedroom with two bathrooms? And that way you have uh, additional egress. Uh, I mean, is that a stretch? Uh, it's, I mean, we don't need a response to that tonight, but I think the applicant should look at the you know the egress concerns as voiced about the um, the basement units, and I, it, it sounds to me like the studios are more concerning uh, than the other units. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something for the applicant, applicant to chew on before the next time we see you. 
Um, other questions and comments on this are on what we've seen before we get into the part three. Yeah, I would just say I appreciate bringing down that ground level relative to those because mm -hmm. it just like feels a little scary to think about trying to get out of that. I know that that's not a very objective standard, but it seems with the ground a little more reachable, as it were. If there's anything else you can do to to continue to improve that condition, it's, it's it would be appreciated. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let's move into the part three. Uh, and I'm going to ask Nikki to help guide us to areas that require our particular attention. Sure. Um, so I did have highlighted, we did the, the lighting and the, the smoking courtyards to talk about those again. Um, also, on page five of the brief, there is the TDMP, um, very short and concise. And then I think the only other thing to look at specifically today is the variances and what the lead agency, U.S. lead agency, how you feel about them. They're mitigated on page eight. All right. This project is not before the BZA yet, right? This is. Groundwork for when we get there. Yes. Technically <laughs> um, in January. So the argument as written for the lot coverage is that the balconies don't really have an impact but are counted as coverage and we've got more green space than I was required. We took a stab at some of these names there for that first one. Yeah. I don't know so this as written, I see reasonable for the lot coverage variance. Uh, to the degree that I imagine that we would stick with this language if it you know, came before us for a recommendation to BZA next month. Um, but I think it's worth reviewing that language and seeing if you're comfortable with it. And then the rear yard setback. Taking out a garage, replacing it with a landscape. Yeah, but the building is closer. Yeah, I mean, I see that as a net improvement. Um, and I'm seeing some nods. Is there a way to say that's a net improvement other than just saying that? It's a positive sure. impact. Positive. Or the landscape mitigate the landscape removal or successfully mitigate the burn. Okay. You know what the buffer is? I don't know what I guess the buffer is for, but it's just grass or is it is it trees and shrubs and oh I think I think that's one. I think that I think there are a few trees and it'll be the Ubiquitous. Sit on the back. Um, so he's going to do this. Yeah, can you bring up the, the right plan? Right. Right. I mean, the site plan. So we can look at the landscape buffer. Plan. Yeah, landscape plan. That's right. Plan. There's also some people here at the environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not much of a buffer, in my opinion. You know, I think if there was more plantings and things there, I could buy into that argument, but I'm not really getting it right now. But yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, so I think it's fair to say that 
Prior to the BZA recommendation, we would like to see some fleshing out of the rear yard landscape plan, just because we're going to end up presumably saying that that is working as a buffer for the, the encroachment on the rear yard. Uh, and so we would like to be able to back that up uh, a little more substantial. Uh, anything else we want to look at in the part three? Well, I just want to say with, yeah. the, with the rear yard too, um, how tall is that retaining wall? We got in details about what it's made out of and how it interacts with the. Yeah, it's parged concrete. It's it's probably six six to eight feet tall. That's so. Yeah. So that's a, that's that's big, and that's. Yeah. That's, that's what exists today. What exists today? It exists today. We're going to rebuild it. It's falling apart. Uh, that might be an opportunity for some sort of vine green strategy. Um, I think having lawn back there is going to be possible. Yeah. yeah. Well, who has access to it? Right. right. You're very yeah. Right. Very tight. Yeah. yeah. Maintain yeah. it too. Yeah. For mitigation. Yeah. He does for that. Yeah. Yeah. Something for the red Um and I'm, and I'm sure that there's important geotechnical reasons we have to do it this way but it does feel weird to me to have a retaining wall to hold up soil so that they can be around these sunken courtyards um you know and if, if that's the way it's got to be that's the way it's got to be but it sure seems weird yeah it's a very <laughs> um we're just working with the existing grade we didn't change that grade i hear that um, but that grade is causing problems for you. Um, yeah. I, so I, I don't know that we totally have an answer for the rear yard setback yet. I think we'll probably revisit that when it comes up for BZA recommendation. And I think to the extent that we can have some flushing out of the re rear yard's mitigation strategy, that would be helpful. Um, anything else we want to talk about on this project or this project's part three? Um, Seeing none. Uh, anything from board of staff? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good night, and we'll see you next meeting, presumably. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And that, I think, takes us through all of the work. Uh, I'll open the floor for old new business and reports for anyone who has some. I want to remind everyone that the next meeting is on the 21st, 20th, 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 20th which is 20th. the third. Yeah. It's, the, it's the third Tuesday rather than the third. Not the third. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But we can yeah. keep PRC the same because it's yeah. all. Yeah. Right. Yes. Any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? I see Elizabeth move and I saw Daniel second. All those in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Four, nine, five. Five.